uh, Dr. Fields has appeared um, as a regenerative orthopaedic expert on national TV as well as local TV and radio shows um, and as a clinical instructor for prolotherapy and hopefully he will be a, an American today that will make good headlines for us as distinct from another American that seems to dominate our news all the time. So uh, I'm sure Peter will give us some, uh, some uh, interesting stories on Mr. Trump today as well. But uh, we look forward to your presentations, Peter. And it's, Peter said it's reasonably open to questions. Is there something during the talks? We're going to talk now for about two hours, but that's a bit of a long stretch for Peter, so he doesn't mind if we break it up a bit if you see something interesting. Is that right, Peter? Yep. All right. Thank you. Welcome, Peter. Well. Wow. I want to thank you very much for that nice introduction. And <clears throat> as he said, like, unlike some other Americans, this is not the largest crowd ever to see this lecture. Um, and there will be no campaign speeches. Um, just to kind of set the pace here, um, I will be tomorrow giving a one hour more concise lecture exactly about that. But this is a four or three hour, and there'll be three hours later in the afternoon. So we're going to kind of go into a little more in-depth. Obviously, if there are questions, just go ahead and ask them as is. But just to start off, how many people here do any kind of regenerative orthopedics? OK, so we have a good showing of hands. Um, and percentage-wise, let's say 50% of your practice is regenerative orthopedics. Any hands? OK. or. How about 25% of your practice? OK, and then one last one. How many people have been doing it, let's say, for more than 10 years? Wow, that's, I'm surprised. I, didn't, I thought I was setting the bar too high. How about five years? And how many are just within the first year or two? OK, very good. Um, so we're going to, if I get everything aligned. Oh, it's already up there. Very good. So as Dr. Ian said, I am the director of regenerative orthopedics at Regen Ortho, Ortho Regen, excuse me. I used to have a big long name for my practice, Specific Prolotherapy and Medical Wellness Center, but over the years, uh, I've honed it down, and that's all I do in my practice. Um, I'm located in Santa Monica, California, the beautiful beach area of Los Angeles, where today it's a nice 27 degrees, but I can't think of that too much. Uh, I didn't even put the top down on my car before I left, but it is in a garage. Um, is Dr. Aaron out there? He might be in another room. Anyway, um, I was asked to come here by the organization. Uh, Dr. Gary Aaron out of Sydney had seen me speak, and he highly encouraged me to explain exactly how I got into this, because there are some of you out there who are just starting, and obviously some of you who have been there and stuff, and he thought that it might be interesting um, for people to have a little understanding of that. And by the way, anytime during this thing, just go ahead and shout out, raise your hand. If you have questions, uh, this is all about interactive. We have three hours. There is Dr. Aaron, thank you very much. Um, and uh, just, as I said, he acknowledged and would thought that maybe my journey into regenerative orthopedics and what got me here and maybe will help you to understand a little bit, not only about regenerative orthopedics, but about why we really do this. So um, as I was introduced, I originally went to chiropractic school. Um, I don't know the exact situation with chiropractors here in Australia, but in the United States, they've risen themselves up from, let's say, a second-class citizen to, let's say, a one-and-a-half-class citizen. There's still some animosity between MDs and chiropractors, but in general, there is not. They are considered the musculoskeletal specialists. And I went into there because I was specifically interested in musculoskeletal and pardon my accent, I could say skeletal, but I'm going to stick with my yank version of skeletal. Um, is that okay, Gary? <laughs> okay. Uh, and chiropractic school in the United States is four years. 
Um, so it was a long four years, and basically you're dealing mainly 98%, 95% with joints and spine. But as you will see, it gave me a tremendous background in the understanding of that. During those four years, you get very, very intense training. During that time, uh, I was exposed to a lot of things. I actually practiced for about seven years. Um, I was exposed to other things that were outside of that, and I yearned for more knowledge about the body. Uh, it was actually in the alternative medicine field, too. I wanted to do things more naturally, holistically, et cetera. So that spurred me on and to go back to medical school. That was not an easy thing. Um, I actually started medical school at the age of 37. Um, and um, in the United States, at least at that time, that was considered quite old, so I was not, I had two strikes against me going back to medical school. Uh, as many of you know, getting into medical school in the United States is uh, <coughs> probably a lot harder than getting elected president, but <laughs> that's another story. Um, plus, I was a chiropractor, and there was some animosity between chiropractic and medical and everything. And I went back to school specifically so I could do more holistic and alternative uh, with the thought of doing some musculoskeletal, but not exactly sure. Uh, so in, for those who don't know, medical school in the United States is four years, and then you have to do a residency anywhere from, well, to not be board certified, you could do a year, but usually it's three to six years. And I did three years in something called family medicine. I know you have general practice here, but in family medicine, you are board certified. And we like to say that about 90 to 95% of walking into any office any patient walking into the office can be handled by a family practitioner. Um, we do some OB, we deliver babies, so we do some minor surgeries, cuts and scrapes and bumps, um, and you can even eventually become even more certified than that. But anyway, I became board certified. I trained at the University of Oklahoma, and I uh, proudly was chief resident, although um, as my uh, director said, being chief resident is like herding cats because uh, you can never find anybody at the right time and you can't ever get them. But anyway, then I developed a bad back and that was kind of the, you know, they say in every dark cloud is a silver lining and that was a silver lining in my, because at that point I did see, uh, we call them orthopedists, I'm sure you call them here, those are orthopedic surgeons, I'll go over that later. And it just gave me some of the non-steroidals and Motrin, ibuprofen, things like that. And it didn't get me better. I even saw an osteopath. Now, osteopath in the United States is a little different than here. They're kind of halfway between chiropractors and MDs. They use drugs and surgery, but do some manipulation. Long story short, um, uh, my, I did go to a seminar on holistic and alternative medicine, and just like this seminar, it had the day before an eight-hour, one-day seminar. And I had signed up, and to this day, I still don't know which one I signed up for, but when I went to register, I saw a colleague of mine, and I said, oh, what are you here for? And they said, oh, I'm taking this course on prolotherapy. And I said, oh my God, I've heard of that. I didn't know they're doing that. So I quickly went over to the registration desk and said, hey, I've signed up for a, can I go in the B? And they said they had an opening and I went in and that basically changed my life because at that time, as I said, I had a bad back. And I'm sorry, I'm just looking at here <laughs> at my next slide. And um, um, and I heard a lecture and prolotherapy, which we'll discuss is the foundation for all regenerative medicine. It was originally called proliferative therapy. Uh, it was actually called many years ago sclero sclerotherapy, but we don't cause a sclerosis, which is a kind of a scarring. We actually cause a new vibrant proliferation, so it became prolotherapy. Anyway, I saw the lecture, and I immediately uh, approached the lecturer and said, I, I need to learn this. I want to learn this. And so um, at that time, um, I still didn't know and I had to go to courses and stuff. I did consult though, still at that point, three neurosurgeons about my back. Because at that point I was having pain down my back and into both legs, two, at, at that point, two to three times a night. I had gone to see 
chiropractors, and there are different techniques in chiropractic. I had seen physical therapists, uh, you call them physiotherapists, saw massage therapists, acupuncturists. Uh, I was about to go up on the mountain and pray with a shaman because it was um, literally when you're woken up three times a night for many, many months, you're at wit's end. And the reason I'm telling you this is that this is what you're going to hear from your patients if you decide to do regenerative orthopedics. Anyway, in the States at least, the neurosurgeons are very conservative in their surgery. Orthopedic surgeons, they say whatever walks into their office, about 70 to 75 or 80 percent are get operated on eventually. A neurosurgeon in the United States, about 10 to 15 percent because they're dealing with the nerves and they know if something goes wrong, that they want that person to try anything else. So I did see three neurosurgeons and sadly all three of them told me that without surgery, um, I would probably live in pain and certainly would not do any athletics. And that is something that I just could not even bear. So um, I'm sorry, I went out of order here. I mentioned about the accidental lecture and through that lecture, I started to go to seminars, train, and I met a fellow regenerative orthopedist, and he started to treat my back, and this was after about six months. Uh, I must say, at that time, I was, <clears throat> had left my residency program. I actually practiced emergency medicine, and if you can imagine, if you've been in a busy emergency room, seeing this doctor on one of these little low chairs with wheels on it scooting around, that was me because I just could not stand on my feet that long. Anyway, uh, he decided to treat me, and the first two or three treatments, I was like, boy, I don't know what's happening, and boom, by treatment four, it started getting better, and treatment five, and uh, so it started slowly, but it did come on, and I'm sorry, I'm still, and uh, that was it. I mean, I took many, many courses. I trained a lot. I actually had a tremendous, let's say, uh, ability at that point because I had had four years of musculoskeletal schooling in chiropractic school. You get some in medical school, but I don't know how it here is in Australia, but musculoskeletal outside of an orthopedist is really not highly uh, delved into. Plus, I had a lot of um, time injecting people and doing minor little procedures in the emergency room, so that's another thing you kind of have to be adept at. In the United States, we have internists, and they've never given an injection or done anything like that. So um, I slowly got better, and uh, now that's all I do. I, I, I slowly morphed and morphed, and I went into private practice out of the emergency room, um, and I started doing holistic and alternative medicine. As we know, we have other lectures here going on. I did bioidentical hormones and uh, IV nutritional therapy and some of the other alternative therapies, and then over time I just honed it down, honed it down, and that's all I do now. And um, as the, the doctor Ian alluded to, I'm a very active triathlete. I am actually, this past Saturday, I actually did an Ironman, I, the fact that I'm even standing here. Uh, my race was just a little under 15 hours. And during that race, a lot on me hurt. I had foot problems, I had a little bit of knee problems, some neck problems, but the most amazing thing is I never had any back problems. So the concluding summary of this whole little introduction story is that once you're fixed, you're fixed for good. And surgery, had I had surgery and it gone right, it would have been great, but had it gone wrong, I would have lived with it for the rest of my life. And a famous saying that I came up with is, once surgery is done, it can never be undone. So with that said and done, um, we are going to just listen. I have a lot of, not a lot, but several videos here, again, from my colleague from Sydney, encouraged me to let you hear what other people say, not only because it's in their words, because, but also it will help you relate to your patients. What do you say to, and I'm gonna deal with that, what do you say to patients, how do you talk to patients, and things like that. But when you hear other patients' words, so we're gonna play you this gentleman here, and I think this is how I get it to go. Hi, my name's Patrick, I'm 65 years old. I was a runner, ran for 35 years, played sports in high school and college. 
I have suffered from constant lower back pain, very, very painful. Um, I tried taking, uh, you know, Advil and stuff like that and stretching, and I could, you know, I could handle, I could handle it, but I finally just got tired of being in pain. I started prolotherapy treatments, and uh, I'm now finished as of today, and I have to say that the pain is completely gone. I no longer suffer any pain in my lower back, and I'm very happy that I did this. Thank you. All right, and by the way, when, and I'll get into that, when they say prolotherapy, they're talking about regenerative therapy. Some people know it by different names and stuff like that, but, um, the bottom line, here's someone 65 years old, didn't know where to go, certainly didn't want surgery, and he was done. So with the next one, I know many of you out there. Um, why one should do regenerative orthopedics. I'm going to open this up a little, get a little. So the people here, whoever raised their hands who are doing uh, who, who here has or is or has done regenerative orthopedics again? Okay, so I'm going to, only because I know his name, start with Dr. Ian. Um, why did you get into this? Okay. Well, we'll, yeah. We'll, we'll get into that. that. That's part of a few slides. But thank you. That was very good. Someone else out there? Who else has done regenerative orthopedics? We have a hand there, too. Um, why don't we get a, a young lady right over there? Here you were. Okay, that's great. Uh, whatever. All right. All right. Very good. One. I think there was someone right there in the middle. Yeah. It's Jay. <laughs> very good. All right, that's, that's great. Very good. Well, thank you very much. And by the way, he managed, managed Janet Travell. She's, of course, long gone now. She was really the founder of Trigger Point Injection Therapy. Uh, I must admit, she came to big prominence in the <coughs> late 50s, early 60s, because 
her very famous patient was the late JFK, the President of the United States, who actually had a horrific bad back. People didn't know that about 90% of the time in the public, he always wore a back brace because he was a um, PT boat captain uh, during World War II in the South Pacific and was involved in an explosion and stuff. But anyway, she, he credited her for keeping him going that whole time because otherwise he was not able to really stand. And so trigger point therapy is, let's say, part of proliferative or at least the beginning of it. Well, we're gonna hear some of the things here that I put down. Okay, the wave of, not of the future, it's the wave of now. I have one testimonial, I don't think I have it up here today, where I did some stem cell on a gentleman about 67 years old, and he did fabulous. And about six months later, eight months later, he played around the golf, and he came off the golf course, and lo and behold, there's the orthopedic surgeon who told him, pardon, that's the way I say it, to have his knee cut off. And I'll tell you why I say it that way later. And he said, hey, what are you doing out here? What are you doing at the golf course? Which is kind of a funny question. He says, what do you mean? I'm playing golf. He goes, but you told me you couldn't walk more than 10 feet. And he says, oh, I decided, did you have surgery somewhere else? And he said, no, I decided to have uh, stem cells done. And it's it did great and everything. And the surgeon looked at him and said, wow, I've heard of that. That's uh, the wave of the future. And he actually said, no, it isn't. It's happening right now. So the point there is, you, as physicians, need to let patients know it is happening now. They might have heard of it. Um, and so getting a little feedback up here. I don't know if someone's in the back there just to let them know. Thank you. Um, so it is the wave of now. It's not the wave of the future. Um, actually, I was just amending this PowerPoint over in the business center, and there was someone from a pharmaceutical company there, and he asked me what I was doing. And then he said, oh, have there been any research studies on this? And I looked and I said, you being in the pharmaceutical industry know as well as I do that 99.9% .9 of all studies are funded by big pharma. That's what we call it in the United States because there's money to be made from a drug. When you're harvesting someone's own bone marrow, owned fat, using their own blood products and even some dextrose, which is prolo, there's no money in that. So yes, there are some studies, but believe me, they're slow in coming only because we have to fund it ourselves. The only thing I can remind you to tell your patients is that acupuncture, I don't know how it was here in Australia, in the United States, acupuncture in the 70s was unheard of. Uh, Nixon went to China, the first US president to go there, and uh, someone there needed surgery and they told appendicitis, and it was actually James Reston who was a Pulitzer Prize winner for the New York Times, and he, they told him he could have it done under acupuncture. And he didn't know what it was, and he, they explained to him, he says, you wanna put needles in me and take out my appendix? So he said, I'll tell you what, you have a board certified anesthesiologist with the mask ready to go, you can try this. Well, lo and behold, they took his appendix out and they only used, as he said, the needles. And we like to say if he, if he had been a writer for the Des Moines Register, nothing against Iowa, but it's not New York. He was a New York Times writer. He came back and wrote a huge article. And this was 19, I think, 76 or 7. And by 1980, there were acupuncturists everywhere. And the, and the statement is, where were the studies? Where were the, there were none. But there was 5,000 years of acupuncture being done. So like with this, more things are being done. That's our proof. The proof is in the pudding. If you're gonna wait for studies, you're gonna miss the boat. Okay, patients are demanding non-surgical alternatives. I don't know, again, here in Australia, but are people wanting to avoid surgery more and more here? Heads are nodding yes. In the United States, unfortunately, uh, orthopedics has exploded. Actually, just a little bit of medical history. In the 50s and the 60s, if you wanted to get into a residency program and could not get into general surgery, you took the default, which was orthopedic surgery, okay? That was the default if you couldn't do general surgery. Then professional sports started to make, like here too, big money, and it boomed. And now you apply and try to get into orthopedic surgery, and if you can't, you take the default which is general surgery, okay? And unfortunately, it's a pyramid thing, so they take about 
this many people in in the first year of orthopedics and that in the second and the third. So if you can make it past your third year, you may make it to the fifth year. But if you don't, you're going back to general surgery. So with that said and done is they control big sports and sports are in the news just like they are here, granted different sports. And it's the jump to surgery, the jump to surgery. And so patients are starting not to jump to surgery. I actually trained a physician who was actually uh, the team doctor for one of the EPL, the English Premier League uh, football teams. I call it football. The Yanks call it soccer. But I'm a football fan. Um, and I trained him, and he said over in England they are totally non-surgical. Most of the teams don't even have an orthopedic surgeon on staff because then the players would run directly to them. They have physiotherapists and sports medicine and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So patients, in the, at least, are demanding more and more. They may not know about it, but you will tell them about it. And if you have something that they want, they will seek you out. Believe me, they will find. And we'll talk about how they can find you. Of course, this avoids any of the surgical side effects. And this is the big thing. As Dr. Ian said, scar tissue and stuff. But I mean, with surgery, first of all, as I said, once done, it can never be done. I will tell you that if you find 100 people online, and remember your patients are going to search online, who have had a successful knee replacement, they're going to praise glory. But if they just find one person that it went wrong, what I like to say is that person will come to their house and stand there, unfortunately in the United States with a shotgun, here maybe with a club, which is probably a lot better, uh, <coughs> and prevent them from having it done because that person has to live with it the rest of their lives. Okay, uh, so the number one thing is you can bleed into a wound, which is really bad. You can have an infection, which any uh, orthopedic surgeon knows that's the bane. That's the worst, worst, worst thing because, you know, osteomyelitis can kill someone. Um, the device can fail. Uh, you can have dehiscence, which is opening up of the wound. And then the worst is they can be in more pain. Now, so he, the doctor here alluded to the fact where they're telling people to go away, go away. First of all, because they're too young, and we'll talk about that. But there's also a pain factor. Most of the people who want a joint replaced, they say, how's the pain? I can live with it. He says, all right, come back when you're in so much pain, then we'll take care of it. And the reason they say that is because they know they can put them in more pain. So on a scale of 1 to 10, if they're at a 5, and after the surgery they're at an 8, that orthopedic surgeon's going to hear it for the rest of his life. But if they're already at an eight, and then the pain maybe goes to a nine, there's not much that of a difference. So they want them in a lot of pain, a lot of pain. So remember, avoiding surgical side effects, and not to do too much of a, dem a walking demonstration here, but I had a patient who was seven, came to see me, he was 79 years old. He was a um, engineer art, uh, for one of the big aerospace industries, which we have a lot in Southern California. And at 71, they replaced his knee. He, had the, he kept complaining about pain in the hospital, pain. They said, oh, just wait, just wait. Three days later, they found out he was bleeding into his wound, and it had disrupted the integrity, integrity of the uh, device. So they had to remove the device, the device, so second surgery, and basically had to lay in bed because he didn't have a knee, okay? Uh, then eventually, when everything had quieted down, they had to re-replace it, third surgery, and this is no fun at 71. And then he had to heal up and he got the physical therapy and the physiotherapist told him that, you know, the primary uh, treatment time is within one to three days after your first surgery. You're now two weeks later. Well, he never ex gained full flexion, bending of the knee. And when you walk, okay, you have to push off and straighten your leg. So he couldn't. So when he walked, he, he had to swing the leg. When he was 79, his knee was so bad, he again went to the company doctor and they told him, you need the other knee replaced. And his answer in a true American form was, you buy the gun, you buy the bullets, and I pull the trigger. So, and I took care of him and I got him better and he was like, too bad I never knew about you before. So remember, once done can never be undone. Even if the procedures you are doing on a patient, somehow, which hopefully they don't, but if they do fail, they can always go forwards. But once you do surgery, that is the last station on the tram stop. There is no going anywhere else. And patients need to know that and hear that. They can't say, let me try it and see what happens. 
They need an educated person like you telling them, if you try it, you will live with what happens. End of discussion. Okay, um, I told you, that's, I created that once done, never undone. It may be grammatically or improper English, but it sounds good to me. Um, it's natural. Patients don't want foreign things. They don't want to take a lot of drugs. They don't want to do surgery. So they're looking for these alternatives. And again, the more you tell them, the more you know, they become educated. You might have brochures. We'll talk about that and stuff. Okay, and there is no hospital. I don't know how it is here, but in the United States, many people do not like going into hospitals. And what I like to say is, yes, pardon the surgeons in the crowd, the bad bugs live in the hospital, okay? The really bad infections happen in the hospital. I don't know the infection rates here. In the United States, the average infection rate for all surgeries is somewhere between seven to 15%, okay? That's not great. Okay, and if you get an infection in the hospital, it can be really, really bad because again, the strong, strong bugs are living there because they've had tons of medic antibiotics killing off the weak bugs and stuff. So patients want to avoid the hospital. They want it natural. Uh, they want it alternatives if it doesn't work out and they want to avoid surgical complications, just like I say there, this becomes a natural choice. Um, again, I'm gonna interject this with a few more, so we're just gonna hear someone who chose not to do it. My name is Wilbur, I'm age 65. I was a firefighter for many years. Unfortunately, I took a bad fall down by the stairs, and I injured several parts of my body, including both of my shoulders. Uh, uh, as a result, I had a significant um, reduction in my range of motion with both of my shoulders. Uh, which really affected a lot of things in my life. My chiropractor worked on me, but was really not able to give me that range back. Uh, at, at a point recently, uh, my chiropractor sent me to Dr. Peter Fields with the recommendation that I look into prolotherapy, which I had never heard of. Dr. Fields did a remarkable job of explaining prolotherapy to me, and we began treatment immediately on both shoulders. I can't even begin to tell you the changes. I have limited range in my ability to raise my arms. Now I can raise my arms in entirely the way I did before I was injured. And now I'm doing core power yoga three, four, five times a week with great range of motion, which is allowing me to, to maintain the flexibility that we all need as we grow older. Dr. Fields, I can't tell you how much I appreciate what you've done for me in changing my life. So again, there's someone couldn't do anything, core power yoga, very, very tough, and the biggest thing changes life. And when patients say this to you, it, it really, you know, you're doing something for them that they couldn't have found anywhere else. Um, and just to let you know, I'm gonna show someone else who changed his life, and he's a pro basketball player. Hello, my name is Christopher Reeves, 31, a professional basketball player in China. Played in uh, numerous countries, been playing for nine years. Um, I had a meniscus tear, a slight meniscus tear, um, found out about it in China. Um, they wanted me to get surgery on it, but uh, I chose to check out other options. I had a friend who referred me to Dr. Phil, said he came in for PRP treatment, and uh, said that might be the best route for me to check out. So I um, called up Dr. Phil, made an appointment. Uh, this is my third treatment and been playing. I played basketball yesterday for the first time in two months um, in a summer pro league called the, the Drew League. Um, got player of the game, which I was surprised, and uh, saw to Dr. Fields and uh, PRP Chef. So, uh, highly recommend it to anyone who needs to recover fast. Get it back out there. So yeah, I basically had, they cut his knee, his, at 31 his career would have been over, but uh, he was able to play, he actually is getting done for his last year. Um, okay, what you need to know clinically, and remember here I am not going to teach everybody clinically, I'm going to just kind of go over the areas and we can talk about that and stuff, but needless to say, um, you know, this is musculoskeletal. Uh, let me just ask again, so obviously people have been 
out of school for several years and many, many years and stuff. How much is musculoskeletal medicine covered in the Australian medical school system? I mean, 10%, 5%, I mean, do you get any musculoskeletal medicine? Do you remember any? Go ahead. So it was kind of like a, it was like a minor thing there. So would everyone say that's kind of their feeling, what they got and stuff? Yeah, it's the same in the United States. It's it's kind of the stepsister, stepbrother, whatever. It's uh, okay, take it. You have to take that class, but. You know, let's talk about that kidney infection and that CHF and et cetera. Yeah, do you have some? Going back to the basketball, is it more meniscus? Yes. Do you believe that your PRP therapy healed that meniscus, or what did it actually do to allow the basketball to play again? Okay. Well, that's a, I'll probably cover that later, but I don't mind stopping now and talking about that. Of course, you have to have an innate ability to play basketball. I didn't have anything to do with that. If I did, <laughs> yes, with absolutely. In other words, traditional medicine, let me just say that, would go in and take out what is torn, and that thing will never grow back. So we are growing back. Now, if you come to my lecture tomorrow, I didn't have it here. I actually have MRI, CAT scans, and ultrasounds showing damaged meniscus, healed meniscus, pre and post. I think my lecture, 9, 9.30 or something like that, if you're here in the morning. Uh, so without a doubt, that's what we're doing. We are actually healing it. I mean, yes, if it's completely shredded, will we get it partially? Again, everybody's ability. Had he not played basketball before, it's not like he was gonna start afterwards. But we are getting those platelets, which have concentrated growth factor, and I get more into that tomorrow, are getting that to heal, are getting those flaps, those tears, those uh, partial thickness tears, full thickness tears to heal. And again, we have I have, as I said, I have MRIs, CAT scans, and x-rays. Most people don't want it, an MRI, I don't know how it here is in Australia. In the United States, you're in that tube, we call it the gong show, and this thing is banging and stuff, and a lot of people don't want it. But in a simplified method, without a doubt, that meniscus is healed. Here's a guy, six foot three, he's able to dunk the ball, jump, and everything. And if you have a torn meniscus, there's no way that's happening. His knee was locking up, he was, you know, he had to be pulled off the court, so. We're getting it to be done. Any other questions before I move on here? It's okay. So clinically, musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal, and as I said, it, it, yes, there are courses you can take. You can read a lot. Now there's online things. But I, you know, in the United States, and I'm sorry I keep referring to that. I don't know, but, you know, I come from an area, of Santa Monica, California, where real estate is well off the market, uh, well off the charts, excuse me, super expensive and everything like that. Um, but they always say there's three things you need to know in real estate, three things that are important when buying real estate. It's location, location, and location, and that's it. So I've kind of uh, changed that around. There's three things you need to know clinically here, anatomy, anatomy, and more anatomy. Now, I run a training course, which we'll talk about later. Uh, doctors come from all over the states, all over the world to train uh, with me and stuff, but before they come, I tell them which books, which this. You can never know too much anatomy. Even myself, I'm constantly studying it. I have what we call a physician's assistant, a PA in the United States. Uh, PAs are almost full-fledged physicians. They have to work under us, but they do what, whatever that physician is doing. Um, and I've trained her for several years now, many courses. We still constantly are talking. We will take out, I have a spine skeleton, a full skeleton. We have charts, we have graphs, 
And the best way is I take my nurse, who is an ex-football player, American football player, so he's big and stocky. We lay him on the table and I'll say, oh, this next patient in, let me show you the wrist. Let me, so you palpate, palpate, palpate. Chiropractors got that because they have to know that. So anatomy, anatomy, anatomy. You can never know too much anatomy. Um, so, and obviously with the anatomy, the number one thing there is the musculoskeletal system. You have to know where ligaments go, where tendons go, what they do. Obviously, you need to know somewhat about the arteries, veins, and nervous system so you're not hitting the big ones. But more importantly, and there are books that show you, and now obviously online, how they move, how they interact. You know, I don't know if they use that little song as children here in Australia, but the knee bones connected to the, the I don't, don't make me sing, you'll all leave the room. Um, but that's true, so you have to know, oh, if I'm treating this, what else could be happening? Or we always call it the other end of the stick. Someone comes in with a wrist problem, I also look at their elbow. Why? Because the radius and the ulna, which are in the wrist, also end in the elbow. Okay, and you have to know how they turn and what's around them and what associated ones. Because remember, a patient may hurt in a certain area, but def their problem may not be in that area or may be partially in that area, okay? Pain is the first thing, uh, is the last thing to come on and the first thing to go away. So they may come in and say, yeah, that doesn't bother me too much there, and then you discover another area. And the way to relate to a patient and even yourself on that is, we've all been to the dentist, not one of our favorite things to do, and you get a teeth cleaning and you're about to leave and they say, oh, the dentist wants to see you, and he says, oh, you have a cavity, because he goes, where? And he takes that little probe and you go, don't probe so hard. Well, before he stuck the probe in there, you didn't feel any pain. But do you think the cavity started growing two minutes before he stuck the probe in there? No, it's been there for months, if not years, and stuff. So it's the same thing in musculoskeletal medicine. The pain will be the last thing to come on. And the first, so you have to kind of educate the patient and show them, look, you're losing function, or look, the other end of the stick, or things like that. So knowing the muscle, I cannot say how important it is knowing the musculoskeletal system. And a lot of times also, when you're talking to your patients, let's say it's their knee. Outside of someone who's had an amputation, how many people just walk on one knee? Okay, no one. So if one knee is bad, is a good chance the other one is, because it's bearing the weight. When we start to walk as children, we're 50-50. Then we get an injury. We may go 51% on one leg and 49 on the weekend. Then it's 52, 48, 53. Remember, so that other one's bearing more and more. It may not hit the pain point. We don't know where the pain point is. If the pain point is 1,000 points and you're at 998 or 798, you're still at the same point, no pain. I've had patients come in and said, I don't understand this. My shoulder was perfect. I played in the yard with the kids. We went on the jungle gyms. I rode bicycles, nothing. I got up in the morning, I reached for shaker salt. I couldn't move my arm, it was killing me. Because they were at 998 and the shaker assault took them over 1,000, which is the pain line. Then again, if they were at 798, it may take falling off a bicycle. So you don't know where they are on the pain line, but you can analyze them and diagnose them and say, hey, you know what, that ligament or that tendon is going to fail soon because it's already showing weakness. Obviously, you need to know how joints function knee joints, elbow joints. Honestly, when you start off doing this, the easiest one to start, and it is the most damaged, most popular, et cetera, et cetera, is the knee. We have two of them, and everybody injures their knee. You know, knees and shoulders. But eventually, you do hips, you ankles, wrists, elbows. Your patients will look to you as that person, so you wanna be the expert in it. But understanding how it functions, how it moves, where the meniscus is, what other parts of the meniscus are there. Very, very important. I've been doing this a long time. I do every, I do TMJs. You know, I do fingers, I do toes. So, um, remember the TMJ is actually a movable joint. It's actually one of the joints in the body that has a disc. And that's a good trivial pursuit question you can win some points on if they still play trivial pursuit. Movement. 
You have to understand movement. Whether your patient is just going out for a walk, riding a bicycle, playing tennis, swimming, golf, racquetball, skiing, hiking, or whatever, you have to understand what they're doing and how they injured themselves. So understand how the body moves, okay? When they reach with one arm, what happens to the other arm? What happens to the contra side muscles and things like that? You don't have to be an expert expert, but whatever you know is going to be a lot more than what they know, okay? And probably a lot more than your fellow MDs, as this gentleman alluded to, because they don't know much about musculoskeletal. So, and there are tons and tons of books and nowadays videos, and I can point you in the right direction and stuff, and it's great. You just watch, even if you just watch a five minute graphic, there's some great ones of shoulders and stuff, and they even unearth them, meaning you can see it with the skin on, with the skin off, with this muscle off, and so you can actually see and stuff. Remember, in this, um, in regenerative orthopedics, outside of going inside a joint space, like a knee or a shoulder or a hip, you're going what we call the anthesis. You're injecting where the ligament and tendon becomes the bone. So you have to know where it attaches and how it rotates. In the shoulder, we have the rotator cuff. We have four muscles. They kind of attach near each other, but they're all distinct and separate. So I don't want to get too much into all those technical things, but understand, if you know this, you will be way, way ahead of the game. Okay, now you need to know this because your patients are going to seek out surgery. Um, here in Australia, are there, can someone go directly to a surgeon or do they have to pass through their GP? They have to go to their, they're like the gatekeeper. So they can't just call up an orthopedic and say, I want an appointment. Okay. So that's even better to talk to your GPs and stuff like that. In the United States, unfortunately, we, well, we have several different insurances and hopefully <clears throat> the current administration doesn't take away universal health care, but that's a whole political thing. But we basically have two forms. We have something called PPO, which is private insurance, insurance and HMO, which is like yours, the gatekeeper. In the HMO system, health maintenance organization, they have to go through the gatekeeper and the gatekeeper being the we call primary care physician. But if people have private insurance, they can do what they want, and people do. They go right to the orthopedist. Now, even before I go there, I kind of mentioned it tomorrow, but it's important. Do people use the term orthopedist here? What do they use? Ortho very, orth orthopod? All right, so, what? God, God, very good. Uh, remind me of the joke, I'll tell you that later, including orthopedists. So the bottom line is, you use orthopod, so a lot of people in the United States say orthopedist, and the patient will come see me for a consult, and you know, work them up and everything, we'll talk about that later, and I'll say, uh, so you don't want surgery? Oh, absolutely not, that's why I'm here, I would never want surgery. I said, then why did you go see a surgeon? And they said, I didn't see a surgeon. Well, it says right here, you saw the orthopedist. Yeah, he's the sports medicine doctor. I said, no, an orthopedist is a short name for an orthopedic surgeon. Now, a few of you are nodding your heads, and this is, of course, of course. Not to the public. They don't know that. They really believe they just went to see a sports guy. Because I say, why would you see a surgeon if you, I mean... Why do you go to a car lot if you're only going to buy a bicycle? <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't make sense. So, and they go, really? I didn't know. I said, yes, their name is orthopedic surgeon. So when I am talking to patients and to crowds, I always say orthopedic surgeon, bottom line. And remember, God spelled backwards as dog. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, and again, unfortunately, and again, I don't know how it is here, orthopedic surgeons, they command this, this authority, and 70 to 80% what walks in their office will operate. I will tell you a little story. We do have several major groups in the United States. I don't have to mention their names. One of them was a big for a lot of the proteins, been around for like 30 years. Um, and anyway, a, a patient of mine went to see one of the doctors there, and he was a doctor in his 70s, and he was like, you know what? I think there are alternatives. I don't know what they are, but you, you could probably avoid surgery. And this was already pretty progressive for a surgeon to say. 
She says, well, I'm going to go get another opinion from an orthopedic surgeon. You know, I'm sure I'll say the same thing. Who are you seeing? And she mentioned the name. And this surgeon said, oh, he'll do surgery on you. I guarantee it. And this is also another well-known group. And the woman said, no, no. Well, lo and behold, this woman went to that surgeon, and guess what? He convinced her to have surgery. Now, how do I know about this story? Because now she's in my office, having had a scope, an arthroscope done, and she still has pain. So be careful where their patients go and stuff. And by the way, uh, in the London Times, I read the London Times from time to time, about two or three weeks ago, there was an article stating they did a big survey of the most abused or overused surgery with the least efficiency in the world. And number one was arthroscopic surgery of a knee, okay? Because in an arthroscopic surgery of the knee, and I did uh, talk to another physician here, they'll tell patients, let's go in and clean it up. Well, basically, that's really what they're saying. We're going to go in there, cut up a bunch of things, and rip a few things out. But if that's how they said it to a patient, they'd be out the door. But clean it up sounds nice, you know? If someone says, let me come to your home and clean it up, you'd say, sure, no problem. Or let me come in there and destroy a few things and take a few things home with me. You'd go, later, buddy. <laughs> okay? So they say, let's go clean it up. And they will always take something out because they get paid to take things out. And remember, once they take it away, that's it, you're done. And second of all, with an orthopedic, with a scope, they are looking through a small scope. And I do this to give you the idea. And sometimes they can't see here and here. I mean, they're going to try to look everywhere, but they're going to be focused where the tear is and maybe not where the other one. Just because they have a tear doesn't mean that's the cause of the pain. Any good radiologist worth his salt will give you a report, but will never, repeat, never tell you that's the source of the pain. I know I talk to them all the time. They say, I don't know where the pain, I'm just going to tell you what's there. And many, many times there's a little flap tear on a meniscus, a little labral tear. It's been there for years. That's not the source of the pain as it was in that woman. He took care of the, the cut, but she had ligament, ligament and tendon instability and stuff like that. So be careful where your patients go. Um, what surgeons will tell your patients? Of course. <laughs> Duh, you need surgery. Okay. Wait until you have more pain. Again, I told you why, because if they have more pain, they have less chance of putting them into that. Uh, you're too young for this surgery. Now, again, here, I don't know how it is in Australia and the United States, if they do a surgery, they may have to repeat it two or three times. With a total joint replacement, a good one lasts seven to 10 years. So if they're 45 and they do it, they gotta do this guy four, four or five more times. But if they're 65, they only have to do it twice. So. There's a kind of a financial business end of that deal and stuff. In regenerative orthopedics, that's exactly when we want to get the patient, before they're in too much pain. Obviously, I told you, absence of pain doesn't mean the absence of a problem. But the presence of pain does mean the presence of a problem. So if you get them, it takes a little talking to patients. You're not in pain, but you have, your joint is dysfunctioning now and you will talk to them and educate them and stuff like that. So you want, not that, no one's ever too young for that, but that should not be an exclusionary factor uh, for doing regenerative orthopedics. Tricortisone. Now, if you come again tomorrow, I can't get into it. Cortisone is the mother or father, depending how politically correct you want to be, but I'm in Australia. I don't have to be politically correct. <laughs> um, of pain control. It will knock out pain, guaranteed. But cortisone will weaken ligaments, weaken tendons, destroy cartilage, thin your blood, cause you to bleed more, raise your blood pressure. I don't want to go on. It's on and on and on. They say that patients should only have three injections in a lifetime. There are pro athletes that have 50 and 60 in one season. Oh yeah, osteoporosis. So it's going to eat up that joint. I have had pro players come to me and say, you know what, unfortunately your joint is gone. How many cortisone shots did you have? And you know, when they get to 30 or 40, I just say stop counting. It eats it up. Now the, here's an irony. When they try cortisone as an orthopod, not their, their, technically they're giving you something that's leading you down the path of worsening your joint. 
because I just told you it has destructive properties. And I'm not thinking like this. Basically what they're saying is take this medicine because it's gonna make you have the surgery that I wanna give you. I mean, it's worsening the joint. On top of that, it's going to take away your pain and pain is a limiting factor in movement. So if you have pain, you won't move that joint and you will preserve it. You understand? That's why I'm not a big proponent of anti-inflammatories. They will take the pain away. You will continue to do the swimming, the biking, the gardening, the running, whatever, and just won't feel it. Your joint will keep going like this and this and this ad nauseum. So cortisone to me, if you have to, have to, have to have it done, but it, it should be a big no-no. Okay, do people know the name Synvisc and Hyalgin? Is this used here? Okay, okay, we, we, these are lubricants. Now this, in the United States, has a failure rate probably exceeding 90% or greater, and to me, makes no sense at all. I use it, I'm not a car mechanic, but your axle is making a lot of noise. So you go to the car mechanic, and he says, you know, you have a bad axle. And if that thing breaks out on the freeway, that's what we call them in the United States, or in Southern California. They call them highway on the other side of the country. And you call them the big freeway? Okay, thank you. Um, he says, if that thing breaks, you could kill yourself. You need to have it replaced and as soon as possible. And you're like, all right, let's do it. And he goes, the bill will be about $7,000. And whether that's Aussie dollars or US dollars, it's a lot of money, and you go, can I have a couple of days to think of this? He goes, yeah, but don't wait too long. So a week later, you're out shopping in the market, and there's the mechanic, and he goes, hey, did you have your axle replaced? And he goes, well, I'll tell you, you know that bad noise it was making? My brother-in-law, he fixes cars. He came over, he looked at it. He said he put some oil on it and doesn't make any noise. And the guy goes, so it doesn't make any noise, but it's still gonna break. That's what lubricants are. They're just lubricating the joint, but they're not fixing it. They're just making it glide a little more. And in the United States, they usually tell people they want a set of three. So every three, six weeks, already now they're several months out. So most people fail that. They do that and then they end up back in the doctor's office saying, well, you know, it, it, while you were squirting it in there, it felt great, but every second day, second week, third week, it just started fading away, fading away. Of course, what they don't say is, and I kept damaging my joint more and more. So whether it's Synvis, Kyalgin, any of the lubricants, I am very, very much against those things. NSAIDs, do you call them NSAIDs here? Non-steroidal anti-inflammatory disease medications. Ibuprofen, which we market as Motrin. Uh, naproxen, we market as Naproxen, and all the others. Again, if you have to use it a little fine, Having done emergency work, I've had people come in in a hypertensive crisis, really bad. They're wheeled in, we're, got, we're talking to them on the gurney. This person's got like 270 over, let's say 160. This is not good. You know, we're like, you're gonna stroke out. And we're like taking the history as they're wheeling them in and the meds, this and that. Oh yeah, I take some ibuprofen. How many, I don't know, four or five. A week? No, a day. How long? I don't know, past five or 10 years. I'm not making this up. So, and then I go, what else are you taking? And they're on a beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor or something else, right? And I'm like, wait, this is driving around town with the foot on the gas and the brake at the same time. One is lowering your blood pressure, one is raising your blood pressure. Of course, this guy, when we got him under control, went for emergency surgery because he was bleeding out through his stomach. He had burnt a hole in his stomach from taking the NSAIDs all that year. That's another side effect. So I'm really not big into that. Plus, um, once you start doing regenerative orthopedics, you are causing a regeneration, a proliferation, and you do not want to stop the, infl the you do not want to stop inflammation. The, all these are COX-1 inhibitors. Do they, Celebrex? You know Celebrex? So Celebrex is a COX-2 inhibitor, it lasts longer, and all the other ones are COX-1. So you don't wanna block those pathways. If patients are taking natural stuff like fish oils, and we use curcumin and uh, some of the other, uh, Boswellia, these are natural herbs and stuff, they're fine, but you don't wanna block those other ones. Are they completely contraindicated? No. 
but if they don't have to use it, you don't want to stamp, dampen, tamponade that because you want to have the body's own inflammatory process, at least on a microscopic level, healing the body. And they tell them to try physical therapy. Now, if something is torn, like they tear a muscle or it's post-surgery and they have to rehab them to walk again, to move again and stuff, fine. But if they have a torn ligament or tendon, you can do physical therapy till the cows come home. It's not going to heal it. Their joint may feel slightly better, but they're still going to have a torn ligament or tendon. And certainly it's not going to heal a meniscus or a labrum. So yes, I like physical therapy, but this is what the surgeon tells them because it kind of delays them. So these major points here, that has a pointer, yeah. Um, you should know because you're, you need the answers to these when the patients come in. Yeah, but he said I should try physical therapy or I should try cortisone. So, are we doing on time? Good. Um, now we're gonna hear someone else tell you a little about himself. My name is Tim, and I'll be 59 years old in a couple of weeks. And a couple, two, three years ago, I had a lot of shoulder pain and went to see an orthopedic surgeon. He was talking about cutting off the end of the bone. He said, don't do any more shoulder presses or dips. He says, your days are over doing that. He said, we'll cut off the bone. We'll uh, get you through a lot of physical therapy, and then you'll have what you have done. And I met Dr. Fields and uh, got some pro therapy done on it. I think it was probably about uh, four or five, maybe six treatments. It took a little bit of work, but uh, today I'm doing more shoulder presses than I ever did before, doing dips, and uh, just uh, keeping up with my real athletic life that I've been doing for the last 30 years. All right, so uh, another happy camper, and um you think there are too many videos, Dr. Gary Aaron, Sydney, Australia, I'll give out his phone number and his personal email shortly. You can fly him in the, find him in the Blue Mountains hiding out on his bicycle sometimes. Um, all right, what you need to tell patients, this is very important, because remember, not only are you going into something new, but you're like, uh, what do I say? How do I talk to them? You know, patients are going, I don't know how, it, again, I'm pretty sure it's the same thing here in Australia. People get on the internet, they come in, they, they a lot of times know, let me see that paper. <laughs> oh yeah, really? <laughs> you know, so they know a lot, okay? Sometimes they know too much and stuff like that. But you need to at least to be able to answer the common questions and things like that. So certain things, remember, when they think of surgery, they go, oh, I only have to be in the hospital that morning or outpatient and then I go home. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> then you got to rehab and you got to go. To, and by the way, that's one of the downfalls of surgery. So let's say you do have surgery on a joint. Then you have to go two to three times to physical therapy for an hour each time. Now, some of us here are privately employed and some work for companies, but what boss is going to let you go from 11 to 12, three days a week, and drive across town and then come back? People don't do that and fail it. But this does take time. We're helping the body to heal itself. So this is not a miracle cure. It's not like I'm gonna inject you today, you're gonna to go out tomorrow and run a marathon. That's not gonna happen. A Couple of months, maybe, on simple injuries, maybe stem cell takes longer and stuff, but you have to heal, the, take, the body has to heal. And you have to remind them, about 80 to 90% of what you treat are gonna be chronic. Chronic is anything over two weeks, but it can be two years, 20 years. And patients all the time come in, and even that gentleman, I'm 55, 59 years old, and you know, it's been a few months. I go, listen, this started when you were 15 and 18, playing football, playing soccer, playing tennis, fell off your bicycle, motorcycle, et cetera, in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s. You're coming to me now. I only met you three weeks ago. So as far as I know, it's been happening three weeks. So give me three, four months. It may seem long now, but in comparison to 20 or 30 years of you living in the pain, it's nothing. So you have to tell them it's going, when they come in there, do not let them think that, oh, wow, this guy's great. He's gonna fix me and next week I'm, you know, I'm in the Olympics, okay? Remember, it's your body healing yourself. We're helping the body to heal itself. 
If that person doesn't get sleep, if that person uh, doesn't do exercise, doesn't do the things you tell them to do, it's not going to heal well, okay? Uh, again, if that person gets drunk every night, if that, uh, we are here in anti-aging and alternative medicine. The person has to take care of their body. They don't have to be fanatic and radical and stuff like that, but they have to do proper things. If you tell them to take supplements, which I'm going to go over, they need to do that, okay? They have to follow the protocol. I'll go over it. We have a post-procedure uh, protocol, and I'll tell you, 95% of the people who call and talk to my nurse or my physician's assistant, sometimes to me, the first thing we say to them is, have you followed the protocol? Of course, the first thing they say is yes. Then we go over it. We have about six things. We very rarely get by number two or number three. Oh, yeah, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. So start doing that and then call us back. So remember, they got to take care of themselves. Don't overdo it. Oh, yeah, I'm gonna, next week I'm climbing Kilimanjaro. Yeah, right. You know, I'm not doing that in my lifetime. But you know what I mean? Or next week I'm doing whatever. You have to understand what they do for work and things. Look, I treat pilots. And I said, look, flying the plane is nothing if I treat your ankle or your foot. But just like any other airport, how about walking through an airport? And I kidded one. I said, it's not going to look too good if, that, if, you're, if, if, you, if they wheel you up to the gate in a wheelchair. I'm not getting on that flight, I'll be honest with you. So, in other words, they got to take it easy. So, yes, that pilot, he flies actually San Francisco on the 787 to Singapore. He, when he has his week block off, he comes in at the beginning. And so he's not walking around a lot. Um, try to avoid ice. Okay, so try and avoid ice. Um, remember, in the old adage, they used to say rice. I don't know if they use that term here. They say yeah, rust, ice, compression, elevation. That's out the window. Heat, 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 and more heat. Why? Ice or cold will slow things down. Down here in Melbourne, you know what sub-zero temperature is. The river doesn't flow when it's frozen. The river's your blood. You freeze out that blood, uh, the, you make it cold, it gets stagnant. Blood in and blood out, it causes healing. Blood in, it brings the new products. Blood out, takes out the bad products. Moist heat, moist heat, not dry heat. It's got to be moist heat. Will help flow, flow, flow. If they are in extreme pain, they can put some ice on to tamponade the pain. But outside of that, heat, heat, heat. We talk about heat. We talk about movement. All right? If they say, I'm going to go home and sit on the couch for the next three weeks, I go, uh, uh, uh. You have to rest, but you got to move. But I'm very, very big on moist heat. I use it a lot. Okay? That will heal the body so much better. Okay? All right, so, you know, the, the typical heating pad that plugs into the wall is dry heat. They make heating pads that have a little, like, wet sack in it, and then uh, jacuzzi, hot tub, boiling towel in boiling water. I have these packs. I don't know if you can get them here, but they're reusable packs. You push the button on them, and it creates moist heat. And then they just have to boil them, and they reuse them over. But it cannot be dry heat, okay? And by the way, the side effect of a regular heating pad is, which I saw in the ER, is that people will, you know, it has that push button that when you release it, let's go. But in the middle of the night, they roll over it and lay on it, and they wake up in the morning with a third-degree burn on their back. So with a hot towel, it's going to get cold on its own. So jacuzzi, hot tub, uh, hot shower, anything, even just five minutes of moist heat is remarkable what it'll do, okay? Um, oh, I said, let me go back, no more NSAIDs. Remember, we're trying to cause a small micro-inflammation, okay? I just use the word to patients, irritation. If you say the word I I inflammation, that's all they're going to hear. Oh, my God, I don't want inflammation. We're causing a microscopic inflammation, not a macroscopic, like where you hit your arm and it blows up and stuff like that. So I just tell them we're causing a small irritation there, and we don't want any inflammation happening. But we are causing a small micro in irritation or inflammation. So you don't want to knock out those COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors. You, you can do all the other natural stuff and things like that. Um, and remember, come back slowly. Not to your office. They need to come back quickly. <laughs> uh, but they have to take it easy. So if they were running, let's say, a 10-kilometer three days a week, when they start off, they run one or two. 
then they run three or four. They build up, they build up, they build up. You can always do more later. You can't do, once you've gone over the line, it's hard to come back. So I just, and with athletes, you're going to be dealing with athletes or people who are very active and stuff like that. You know, if they're a runner, put them in the swimming pool. Or if they're a, a skier, maybe put them on a stationary bike. Just make sure they come back slowly and uh, you educate your patients. And maybe yourself, you have someone in your office at least to talk to them about that. Because they're going to call many, many times. Um, how are you feeling? Okay, it's sore. Have you been doing the moist heat? Yeah, how often? I don't know, once every couple of days. We tell them two or three times a day the first couple of days, then once a day from there on in. It's not that hard, 5, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, we're going to listen to this guy tell you about his ankle. Not really wanting to throw around names, but I will say that he plays on a soccer team that is sponsored, and the sponsor plays at least the first half of both games by the name of Rod Stewart. Yes, Maggie May and all the old rock and roll songs. And at 66, he still plays half of each game. But this gentleman, obviously, you see, you're giving them back their life. And they're like, what do I do? And so. The benefit of doing this, the overall, is that you are taking people who thought they had to get off the bus, and they don't. There are alternatives. They can get better, and they can do stuff. So how to properly assess a patient. Again, we're not going to go into the whole musculoskeletal and et cetera, et cetera thing. But you know, there are some basics that everybody needs to know for exams and stuff. Uh, history. You have to take a history and ortho focus. Yeah, you know, you're, someone's going to write down maybe the meds. They, if they're on blood pressure medicine and their blood pressure is just fine or even a little bit elevated, if it's highly elevated, I tell them, go, go see a real doctor. No, right. go see a regular doctor. But it's not our problem. It's okay. Obviously, if it's tremendously out, but, you know, the, your orthopedic focus. So with an orthopedic, and I spend, I actually teach a course for uh, an attorney who does a lot of stuff in California. It's a two-hour course just on history and physical, okay? So obviously I can't do it now. So ortho-focused, um, you want to know about the sports they played, even as a child, if they had any broken bones, fractures. By the way, just on a simple thing, just like with orthopedist and orthopedic surgeon, if you tell someone ask them if they had any fractures. Later on, they're going to go, oh, yeah, I broke a bone. They didn't know it. Or if you say, did you ever break any bones, they'll say no. And later on, they'll say, but I had a fracture. So there's a nod of a head. She knows it, OK? It happens. So you have to dumb it down. Did you ever break any bones or have any fractures? And I've never had anybody say, that's the same thing. <laughs> so say it to them. Major traumas, look. If they rolled their ankle once and you're treating their shoulder, you're not worried about it. But if they rolled their ankle and you're treating their knee or ankle, it's a thing. What sports did they play? And yes, I don't care if they're 70 years old. What sports did they play? And the body has a tremendous memory. Now look, everyone fell off a bike as a kid. But oh, you know what? My mother told me once when I was eight, I fell off a bike and I was in the hospital for three days. That's significant. Neck trauma, low back trauma, hip trauma, things like that. Sports, big thing. The last one there, ADLs, we call that in the United States, activity of daily living. What do they do for a living? 
And if they say they're a banker, you have to say, okay, so you sit at a desk, oh, no, 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 I'm going to clients all the time, I'm carrying portfolios. In other words, you want to, do they have an active job, an inactive job? As I said, the pilot I treat, he's got it both ends. He walks through these big, big airports, and as he says, then I sit in a, in a metal tube for six to eight hours or 12 hours. So he's got back problems, believe me. You sit, you sit, you sit. So what they do in, in understanding not only how they injured themselves, but if they are to be treated by you, what you need to tell them not to do, okay, and stuff. Um, if they're someone who has a partially active job, can they be a little bit inactive? I treated, I did stem cell on, a, on an emergency room nurse. Guess what? One month off, she took off. I said, if you take off longer, it'd be greater. I goes, I've worked the ER. You punch that clock, the next time you sit down is when you're in your car going home. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's how busy our ERs are. So, and major traumas, the little things not. But, you know, did, oh yeah, you know, once I fell and um, they said I had a slight concussion. Did you hurt anything else? Oh well, yeah, my shoulder bothered me for a week or I was in a big car accident. So we spend a lot of time on that and with the sports, and how long were the sports, and were there any injuries in the sports? Did they ever tape their ankle, okay? Did they ever have to walk on crutches? Patients start to remember things. I must admit, having someone who is related or very familiar with that person there is, is actually a good thing, at least during the interview, because they'll go, oh, you remember you broke your wrist three years ago? Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. So. And you always end it with, if you ever remember, remember, excuse me, remember anything, please let us know. Um, what makes it better? Oh yeah, when I move my arm back, I put it up here, I raise it over my head, what makes it worse? Okay, what are the things you can do to trigger it? And that takes a lot, a lot of times they have to think of it, but believe me, there's always something. Because that's gonna tell you about motion and how they're functioning and how they're moving. And you know, when I open a jar of sauce or when I, put the clicker on, uh, the turn signal on, or reach for the radio. Uh, and of course, are they taking anything for pain? And I put meds for pain there, but it's gotta be anything. Ice, heat, uh, even fish oils, any of the natural stuff. You wanna know, because that'll help you in treating them. And again, I'm going over this sort of quickly, but this is a lot of your exam. Obviously, you're gonna have to know the orthopedic exams for the elbow and the shoulder and stuff. You don't have to know everything, but if you know a couple of them, you should familiarize yourself with the ranges of motion, the normal and what's abnormal. You don't have to be so exact. Of course, like every other good regenerative medicine physician, just have it right on your chart. Normal, abnormal, 30 to 60. Ah, all right, he's moving it. He can only move at 10. I don't have to go running looking up what it is. Okay. Um, that's just in the history. Physical exam, you know, watch them move. This is a big thing. Whatever body part you're examining, you should see them move, as they say, au naturel. Not a t-shirt on, not a skirt on, whatever. You need that body part exposed. If nothing else, you're going to see a scar there, or a lump, or a bump, and stuff, or a rash. Oh, what's that? Oh yeah, I forgot to tell you, I fell last week. So watch them move, watch them walk, okay? Individ every joint gets an exam. There's an exam for cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine, for the pelvis, for the hip, for the show. You know, I have preset ones, so we ask them up front, and if they come in the room and say they want another body part, we go and get that other chart. Everyone, first of all, documentation, documentation, and also you have a record of it, and you have the graph right in front of you. Um, Favorite topic of mine, X-ray, CAT scans, MRIs. Now I put it down there because, at least in the United States, you go to see an orthopedic surgeon, he says, let me see that MRI X-ray. And he goes, oh yeah, you need surgery. And the answer is, aren't you gonna look at me first? Why, it's right here. I don't do procedures on MRIs, CAT scans, or X-rays. I treat patients. So as a patient comes to my office, I take the X-ray, MRI, CAT scan, it goes in a fire somewhere, but I do not look even at the report until I'm done. Why? Because like a good physician, I want to form my own opinion first. You see that, you're prejudiced. I gave a lecture in Las Vegas in front of a big crowd, 
And I said in that crowd that 80 to 90 percent of all orthopedic diagnosis come from history and physical. And this is in the textbook of orthopedic medicine written by a Turek, T-U-R-E-K. It was written in the 50s, been updated, still used. That damn book is this fat. I'll give you a hernia just picking it up. Anyway, I get done, I'm outside, there's a group of doctors around, one guy says, hi, I'm so-and-so, semi-retired orthopedic surgeon, I'm 75 years old, I loved your lecture, but I disagree on the percentages. I was humble, I said, oh, you mean the one about the diagnosis? He said, yes. So I said, what do you think it is? Because I said 80 to 85 percent. And he goes, what do you think it is, 60 to 65 percent? He looked me right in the eye and he must have met in his. He said, Sonny, I think it's 100 percent. I think they're getting far away from examining and talking to the patient and looking at the MRI and the x-rays for the results. Hippocrates or someone way back in his era said, if you talk to the patient long enough, they'll tell you everything that's wrong with them. In the United States, the average amount of time a doctor spends talking to a patient is seven minutes. Seven minutes. So a doctor who talks 10, there's another guy doing four to balance them out. <laughs> okay, get the picture? Spend time talking to the patients. Let them know. I allot 40 minutes for a history and physical. It's short or fine. There's a lot to go on. So back to the x-ray, MRI, and CAT scan. Remember, there are people who've had surgery on a torn, what they see in the meniscus, and they're still in pain. I had a patient came in, okay, who they said they took out what was there. What else could he do? And guess what? That wasn't the cause of their pain. And sometimes it's even misdiagnosed, okay? They're not 100% foolproof. You know, the old adage, if you get 10 radiologists in a room, you're going to get 12 opinions, okay? So, and here's the other thing, by the way. Are any radiologists here? Okay. Well, we can tell jokes about them later. But no, they sit in a room outside of interventional radiologists and read, 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 read. They love to get a phone call once in a while. Hey, Mom, I'm doing well. No, you don't have to do that. You call them. They love to talk to you. I call them all the time. Hey, Doc, how you doing? I got, could you pull up file 68421? Yeah, fine. Boom, and we talk about it. Oh, yeah, he goes, and I said, you know, when they do this, they can't do that or this. Really? Well, yeah, maybe that if I put down should be more a maybe or an absolute. Do you want me to amend it? I said, absolutely. I'll tell you the truth. I had a patient come in. They said, most likely completely torn ACL, anterior cruciate ligament. Now, which we didn't go over yet. I cannot gap air. We're not miracle makers. You have to have at least 10% opposition in a tear, okay? So when they say most likely complete tear, and if I inject her and she goes wrong, and she sues me or something happens, they go, they had a complete tear, what were you doing? So I called this guy and I told him about the exam, it's called McMurray's test, you can look it up later. I said, there's no way. And he goes, well, you know, when it's over 80, I put it down. Now, over 80 gives me 20%. I said, so it's at least 10%, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I said, would you mind amending that to say at minimum of 10% and maybe greater non-torn, you know, still attached? Absolutely. So he sent it back to me. It was great. So what's on there? They're not foolproof. Use, use your head. Look at those. You can become experts in it. And again, I'm not sliding orthopedic surgeons, although we can. Um, they're going to tell you that they read that MRI. They know what they're doing. Now, again, a good orthopedic surgeon may read five or ten in a week. Why not? Five or ten, you know. Guy has a fracture. He's not reading an MRI. He sees x-rays. Five or ten MRIs in a week. Let's see even ten. In the United States, a good orthopedic surgeon, a good radiologist must read close to 100 a day. If you've ever been in the room, they have these big sheets coming down. Boom, boom, read three, four minutes, next, next. We always say if they're reading 10 a week, they're out on the corner panhandling. They're out of a job. So if they read 100 a week, 400 a month, do the numbers. They are the experts in reading MRIs and x-rays, hands down. So if they come in, they see the orthopedic surgeon said, absolutely, it's this still call the radiologist, because MRIs have to be taken in big centers, and there's always a radiologist reading it. So 
Yes, do we need them, but we absolutely don't need them on everybody, okay? Uh, when I do stem cell, I want to see an x-ray from my own. I'm very good at reading x-rays from my chiropractic background, but CAT scans and extra MRIs, I'm not, but I can still kind of get an idea, but I want to see the report. So that's, but the biggest thing to take home from here, the take home story is that do your history and physical, try, it's very difficult at first, don't look at that MRI x-ray report, because then you will have something in your mind and you're going in that direction. Form your own opinion and then see there. And you will surprise yourself how accurate you are. Because you will say, you know, it's probably this, or maybe this, this, and that, and lo and behold, there's the report. And then you'll go, hey, good job, guy. <laughs> so, um, what does regenerative medicine treat? Okay, so we wanna know, doing good. Half an hour or 20 minutes, we got a little question and answer, and I think we take a break. Uh, what do we treat? We treat lots of things, everything musculoskeletal. So, weakened, torn, damaged ligaments and tendons, okay? Very simple. I'm going to add a few more things here. Shoulders, knees, backs, necks, ankles. You don't have to do all of them, okay? I'll just start listing them. Sports injuries, muscle tears. You can inject into a muscle tear. Fibromyalgia, okay? Tendinitis. Now, by the way, tendinitis, I don't know if you know, there's also a word. How many people have heard of the word tendinosis? Okay, a few out there. So, itis means inflammation, means acute. You roll that ankle, it swells up like a grapefruit, you got an itis, appendicitis, tendinitis. Now the swelling goes down, but that ankle still hurts like stink. You don't have tendinitis. The itis is gone. It's acute. Now you have tendinosis. There's no more inflammation, but there's still a dysfunction. And yes, we don't use it as much, but ligamentitis or ligamentosis can also, are also words. So. They don't have to have the swelling, but we put, everybody says tendonitis, so we put the word up there. Arthritis, again, that's a, I can't tell you how many times people call and say, do you treat arthritis? Arthritis is a general term. It's such, it, it's actually arth from the Greek or Latin means joint, and itis is inflammation. So it's just every, you know, I got tendon, I got arthritis. You know, yes, what is the dysfunction? What is causing the arthritis and stuff like that? So when people say, do you treat arthritis? The simple answer is yes. But the, you're saying, that's like saying, you know, do I treat human beings? I mean, everybody's going to have something there. Sciatica, yes, absolutely. L4, L5 from the lumbar spine. Bursitis, yes. Why? Because the bursa is a pad that allows for gliding of two tendons. And guess what? When it's itis and it's inflamed, inflamed, it didn't just happen on its own. It happened because the tendon was dysfunction. So if you treat the tendon dysfunction, the itis goes away. And they do have bursectomies. We, oh, what do we, oh, well, we took it out. Well, guess what? He didn't have the itis anymore, but now those tendons don't function well because they don't have a gliding pad. So that's another wasted surgery. TMJ, as I told you about that, he has a joint. Now, we do, as I said, we can turn or damage the ligaments and tendons. We damage cartilage. That's what stem cells are about. We're going to talk about that in another hour or so. Uh, that's important. We do treat cartilage. We do treat meniscus. Fix them all the time. Partially torn, this and that. And we do treat labrums. The labrum is kind of like the meniscus. It's in the shoulder and the hip. A little side story here. With the MRI and CAT scans of tendons, your patients are going to call or your staff will tell you, well, that patient called, they got the MRI, and they said they have a full tear, so they're not coming in. Because you said you don't treat complete. Oh, wait a second, I didn't say that. I said I don't treat if it's fully torn off the origin and insertion, meaning my finger's off, I can't treat it. But a full thickness tear goes from top to bottom, meaning these two are attached, okay? And it just goes from top to bottom like this. That's a full thickness tear in the fibers. When they look at it, they can see from top to bottom. We treat those all the time. Partial thickness means they can only see halfway down, they being the radiologist. So we treat full thickness tears all the time. If it's torn off or of retraction and it's coiled up, either they live with it or it has to be surgically repaired. But remember, 10% opposition, if you're good, you can go in and do that. But very rarely are things fully torn. 
Unfortunately, everybody knows the track athlete in the Olympics, he's running down, he grabs his, you know, his hamstring and he's laying on the track. And if they look closely, you'd see a big ball in the, in the middle of his hamstring. That tendon is coiled up like a snapped rubber band. He's done. Surgery or he limps the rest of his life. But all these other things we do treat. Um, we're going to listen to a guy now tell you about his experience with stem cell. So, you know, Robert said something there, which I thanked him for later. I don't prompt him. When he talked about sin risk, he said it was like a non-event. A non-event. In other words, it didn't even happen. So, had he not heard of me, maybe they would have convinced him. And he said they don't last too long. As I told you, the average knee replacement will last seven to ten years. That means about every eight years they have to redo it. And believe me, it does not get easier over time. Because then he would have been 73 and then 80, et cetera. And lastly, there's, are there any anesthesia, anesthetists here? <laughs> okay. There's general anesthesia. Most of the procedures for full joint replacements are done under general anesthesia. There's inherent problems with that. There are neurological changes in the person. There can be complications. I don't know if people here knew the personality, she was big throughout her life, Joan Rivers, she was a comedian and did a lot of other things. She passed away about three years ago from the complications of anesthesia. She had a little vocal cord biopsy, not by a removal of a little nodule on her vocal cords in a surgery outpatient center and something went bad and they could not intubate her right away. She went anoxic. And three days later, her daughter decided to pull the plug. And the only reason you never hear about what caused it was because it was such, as we call it, a slam dunk uh, closed case that they just said to her daughter, how much do you want to be paid? As, we'll give it to you, but you have to sign something that you never talk about it again. So in, 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 if you have people over 60 or 60, how many people treat people over 60 or 65? <laughs> Everybody. Okay. They are afraid of that general anesthesia. You get them over 80, they say, I will live with this pain the rest of my life. I'm, my friend Mary had this and that. There are all sorts of studies done, by the way, with psychological and neurological changes that last forever and ever. So, um, and then here, we're just gonna, this guy will tell you about his neck.
So yeah, I do treat necks, and obviously if you're gonna start doing it, that's not the first place to do it, but uh, people do get better. First guy was with stem cell, he was with more PRP and prolotherapy. But um, you need to know what it does not treat. Obviously we can't treat everything. Obviously if someone's got fractures, we, don't tr we treat soft tissue. We don't treat bones, end the discussion. Um, and uh, bone tumors, obviously if someone has a bone tumor, uh, you're not treating over that area or even remotely close to that area. Obviously, if they have a bone tumor in their shoulder and you're treating their knee, that's fine, but you need to know about that. Neurological disorders, we get it all the time. I'm not growing nerves back. I'm not treating neurological. I'm not treating cord uh, lacerations. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, for his neck? Yeah, so the spine, and again, tomorrow will be a little more in, uh, specific on that and stuff, but the spine you have a tremendous amount of ligaments and tendons, thousands, okay? As a matter of fact, the facets, which are the, uh, what each vertebra abuts itself with, has a ligamentous capsule around it. So basically, he had weakened ligaments and some tendons around his uh, cervical spine. Now remember, the cervical spine is also interrelated with the upper shoulder and stuff like that. So basically, these were injections into those ligaments and tendons to get them to proliferate, regenerate, and stabilize, stabilize, take the pressure off, and as it takes the pressure off, the space will open up, the disc won't be pushing out, which was causing his radiculopathies. And... Okay, so we're going to talk about dexos, PRP, and prolotherapy, the three different kinds. They use the term prolo, but sometimes it's prolo and PRP. In a nutshell, you have prolotherapy, which is dextrose injections, treat mild to moderate ligaments and tendons. When they get more damaged, uh, or you have meniscus or labrums, you want more. Dextrose causes um, pla mainly platelets, some white cells, to be attracted to an area, okay? I tell the general public it's causing it to attract. To physicians, I'll tell you that dextrose is a hyper osmolar solution, take you way back to chemistry days, high dense solution, going into hypo cells, hypo osmolar cells, that causes them to burst open. It's a natural function. One cell, but you got billions. When that does it, it releases chemotactic or little chemical factors that cause the body emergency vehicles to come to that area. The body emergency vehicles are basically platelets and white cells and they come there and start to repair. What you're doing is you're triggering the body. Here's an area that's been damaged and the body's not fixing it anymore. And you're re-triggering it to start to fix it. It's like getting a paper cut on your hand and three months later you don't even know which hand it is. But then someone says, what's this little lump on your forearm scar? And you go, oh, when I was 12 years old, my buddy pushed me off a bike and I still have the thing. So the hand healed in three months, you can't see it. This one didn't. We're triggering areas that are not healing itself with that dextrose, and then those platelets start a proliferation of growth. When you want more platelets, and platelets are growth factor, there are ways to process platelets and concentrate them down. And I use a machine, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, that gets it to seven to 10 times the concentration. Normally you have a million per cubic centimeter, of platelets in blood, I can get seven to 10 million. Some concentrators only get three to four. And if you're getting more platelets, you're getting more growth factors. So some more severely torn ligaments and tendons, labrums, meniscus, and that causes that to grow. So yes, that's prolo and PRP. It's kind of in the same thing. Stem cell is a different thing. Stem cell, and I don't know if I have it in a later slide, so I apologize if I repeat myself, but stem cell basically are for bone on bone, no more cartilage, have your joint replaced. Mainly knee, shoulder, and hip. And w there, they have the ligamentous tendus dysfunction. They may or may not have the labral and the meniscus tear, but they have loss or denuding of cartilage. And you have to get that cartilage to come back because then you won't have a rubbing surface. And that's what stem cell does. I'll talk, let me keep going, but good question. Did I answer? Thank you. Uh, neurological disorders, systemic disorders. Now I put rheumatoid down there because when someone comes in to have rheumatoid, I wanna see them. I cannot treat the metabolic dysfunction that's happening that's causing their body to attack itself. They need someone who's doing that, but they have also weakened their ligaments and tendons or destroyed part of a joint, that I can treat. 
So I don't treat the rheumatoid, I treat the dysfunction joint within the rheumatoid. But they have to make sure they're getting someone to treat the other side, otherwise it's a push me, pull me. You know, I'm fixing it, they're destroying it. I'm fixing it, they're destroying it. So uh, it can. And um, this guy also will tell you about what stem cell, I think then we'll take a break. Good afternoon, my name is Larry. Uh, I'll be 72 years old. I have always been active in sports, skiing, you name it. Uh, jogging over the course of time. My knees took a pounding and then they sort of became almost more and more. About a year ago, I went to my orthopedic man and he said, well, when you can't get off of, uh, out of the car, you learn that you need to have your knees replaced. And I thought about that and I said, well, what's a short-term fix? He said, well, let's try some steroid shots. That will probably get you through summer. But that's long-term not good for you. You really should uh, have your knee replaced. Long story short, my massage therapist told me about Dr. Peter Fields. I had a consultation with Dr. Fields. Uh, I was impressed with uh, referrals, and not only that, testimonials that I had heard. And he said, if I don't feel you're gonna be 80 to 90% better, I will do it. I want a successful uh, clientele. So I said, okay, what about me? And he says, I think you're gonna be great. And it's been five months, I just came back last week, 10 days ago from a family vacation. We skied our brains out. Not the first couple days, Dr. Fields told me we could work. But then I got back into my normal routine and had a wonderful ski trip. I have 100%, the left knee's 1,000% uh, perfect. Right knee's about 85, almost 90%. And I wish I had come earlier and listened to what my physical therapist had told me to do. Uh, Dr. Fields has been a, a real solution for me. Back to riding a bike, stationary bike, an hour at a time, 30 minutes at a time, walking a good hour at a time. Couldn't be happier. So for those of you that are in doubt, I'm not getting paid for this today, give him a shot. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, here's a guy, again, back against the wall, didn't know what to do. He said they gave him steroid shots, which was not the best thing in the world. At least the surgeon there said, hey, you know, um, they're not really going to help you and stuff like that. Stem cell is not an answer for everything, but for those that it is, you know, I do a very long history in physical, as I told you, and if I don't think I'm going to get them at least 50% better or more, I'm going to tell them right up front. Now, if they choose to do it, that's their own accord. As you saw, one knee got 100% better and the other about 80, and it'll probably continue, because remember, these things grow, grow, grow. Even with stem cells, I tell patients, you need a doubling time. Now, technically, by study, you only need 10 and can keep doubling, but even if you get a million in there, 10 become 20, become 40, become 80, become 160, 320, don't let me do the rest of the math. They have to double and double till you get billions and trillions and gazillions in there. And, but we, they don't double every day, so we tell patients, give it time. Give it a couple of, you saw him, three, four, five months. He started off skiing, he went a little easy, he went a little more. But it gives people the alternative. Of course, people would ask you, well, how about if it, let's say it did fail. Let's say this only lasted him six or eight years. Well, then he's 72, and he would only need his re knee replaced by statistics one more time, the average male living to 79. But... It won't, believe me. Now, I do have patients when I do stem cell, and I talk about it more tomorrow or in the second half. There are many different kinds of procedures, okay? Not all stem cells are created equal. And just like someone can, I could drive a Volkswagen, a 68 Volkswagen bug, and someone could drive a 2017 high-end Mercedes, we both can say we drive a car. But outside of that, they're not the same. So there's a lot besides the skill level and the proficiency of the person doing it. I do something called the gold standard. It's been written up in a magazine. Granted, it was a medical magazine in the United States. I wrote the article. Um, I, many physicians either use bone marrow or stem cell uh, or fat. I use both. 
So it takes a little longer. I get stem cells from bone marrow. Yes, we go inside a bone marrow. That's where all your good cells are produced. There you get a lot of multi-lineage or broad spectrum, but they don't go that deep. In fat, you get less lineage, but they go deep. So if you get fat and bone, I feel you get the whole picture. Then I use those platelets. I told you platelets have growth factor. Growth factor, yes, they have damaged ligands and tendons, but those growth factor are specifically to get the stem cells to grow. Remember, they're growth factor. They're going to get things to grow. And if you put them on top of stem cells, they will help those stem cells accelerate the growth. And lastly, in the gold standard, we treat the outside. There are some physicians who only treat the inside of the knee, and maybe justifiably in their mind so, because that's where the problem is, or that's where they see the cartilage is missing, or the meniscus is torn. But again, if you go back to the beginning of my lecture, what caused it, and tomorrow I'll show you in better pictures, the weakened ligaments and tendons on the outside caused the inside to go like this. So I'm going to rebuild the inside, but I want to make sure the outside is strong enough. So I treat the outside. In the knee, you have the quad tendon, and then you have three big tendons that come down from the hip that land in the, an area called the pes anserine, actually. It's a sartorius gracilis and semitendinosus. You don't have to remember them, but they are three big tendons when you learn your anatomy of the knee. You have the medial collateral, the lateral collateral ligament, and yes, maybe in the ACL, although that's within the knee. But the other ones I mentioned all on the outside, they have to be tight, strong. They become weak and torn or damaged with time. So with that, that is called the gold standard. And we process it, and actually I use a very high ultraviolet light that stimulates and potentiates stem cells and platelets. Yes, it's a $2,000 light, but the potentiation is worth it for my patients. So my procedure takes four to five hours, and we take our time and we make sure we do it uh, correctly. But again, I've had patients who've come from other states, at least in the United States, who've had the procedure done. It didn't work, and we asked them what they had done, and I say they've only had a partial because they didn't do what I just described to you. So no offense, but to the Volkswagen people, they were driving around in that 68 Volkswagen, and all of a sudden someone sat them in a brand new Mercedes, and they say, whoa, there's a big difference here. I, this is my body. I want the best. But again, time, time, time is a big factor. And again, stem cell is not for everybody, but if it can help them and give them a chance. I mean, I did have someone just a few weeks ago, and I'll be doing them when I get back. We said one knee was about, and he was 85, he had had a stroke, and the surgeons don't want to touch him, so he had no choice. I said, your one knee, I'll give you about 70, roughly 70 to 75%, which is tremendous. That's decreased pain, increased range of motion, everything. I said, your other knee may be less than 50 or 40, but you need to know, and he says, I want to try it on both because I have no other alternative, but at least it's something. So we're always at least getting something. We're getting some forward progress with that. With the gold standard comes two follow-up treatments with just PRP. We call it a booster shot, not a booster for vaccines, because by putting the platelets in there six and 12 weeks later, we're putting more fertilizer, more growth factor into the area where you need it the most, okay? Uh, we're putting fertilizer into this inside of the joint at 6 and 12 weeks. Now, we can do it at 12 and 18 weeks. This, I just did a guy from Germany. He'll be back in three months. But it's always good to get that because that stimulates it even more. Those platelets will double. We tell patients at three to four months, they will start to feel it. Some feel it at six weeks, but if they start to feel it. But starting doesn't mean they're finished and then it will grow and grow and grow. The first guy you saw, Robert, I did him in March. He literally walked in my office on a cane, and I had been treating him for years. And yes, he's 68, and now he's 70 or 71. And he's a surfer, he rollerblades. I don't rollerblade, give me a break, all right? And he skis. But he walked in on a cane, and I saw him that sign, and I called him, you know, I did him in March, in May or June, he was like, well, maybe, maybe a little better, I don't know. December, November, I happened to speak to him. I was shocked. Nicaragua happens to be a big Central American surfing spot. And he said him and his wife went to Nicaragua. And I accidentally said, that must have been terrible. What do you mean? I said, you had to watch all those people surf. He goes, what do you mean watch? 
I was surfing with guys half my, younger than my children. <laughs> so even I was surprised because he hadn't shown the, hadn't seen him. So it takes time, it takes time. And then, of course, he went off skiing and everything like that. And once in a while, you know, I think a year and a half, two years later, he came in just for some PRP just to tighten up the joint, but again, on the outside. So remember, be careful about where they choose that. I just got a little sign through the door. You couldn't see it. It said five minutes, and that was about five minutes ago. In the second half, I'm going to go over some marketing and what to, how to get the word out and what to tell people and stuff. Again, tomorrow, my lecture at 9 or 9.30, uh, you can ask my agent over here in the blue jacket, Mr. Dr. Gary Aaron, um, <laughs> what exact time it is. Uh, but I will show you MRIs and everything and go over specifics. So we have about a half an hour break uh, for tea and biscuits, and uh, I'll be around here to answer any questions, but thank you very much for now. There, I appreciate it. And if you have any questions, by the way, just go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, one of the biggest, uh, most seemed like a common question was, you know, the protocols I use, and which I was gonna discuss, but, you know, it's very important when you assess someone, you determine approximately how many they need, but you really don't know until they start healing. So, but on average, with a dextrose prolotherapy, they need somewhere between five to seven treatments, obviously six being the average, and three to four for PRP. The dextrose is about every three weeks apart, and the prolo, the PRP, is every four to six weeks. So even though the price is about double for the PRP, they are paying about the same price because they're doing less. But the biggest thing is that people who fail to come in, so they have to, well, you know what? I did one or two and I was feeling great. Remember, feeling great doesn't mean you're done. If we examine them and we determine they're done, they're finished, that's it. But a lot of times people say, oh, I feel great. They come in, we do an exam and we say, oh, and they go, oh yeah, I'm still hurting when you do that. Well, you still need it. So you try not to let the patients drop off. I guess in general medicine, it's akin to someone taking a 10-day course of antibiotics and saying at day six they felt great, so they stopped it. You know, so the bottom line is um, they should follow through. With STEM, obviously it's a one-time procedure, at least the way I do it. I've never done anyone more than twice, more than once, excuse me. Um, the PRP, I see them six and 12 weeks later, but it could be 10 and 15 and weeks later. But the biggest thing is having them follow through on protocols. So a lot of times people don't, and we see them a year later, and they're okay, but they're not completely better. Now, with that said and done, you could wait a year between treatments. I've done volunteer work for nine years in Honduras, which is the poorest country in Central America, and where we actually treat people and teach doctors from around the world these techniques. We treat them only once a year. And my patients know that, and they say, what's going on? I said, okay, they only needed two treatments, but it took them two years, or if you get six treatments, you'll get better in about three and a half to four months. Which one do you want? Well, that's a slam dunk. Of course, they're all taking three to four months. So remember, these treatments will continue to proliferate, to grow, regenerate, but if you do them compactly, they will get better, faster, quicker, and better. Uh, they could wait that long, but we highly don't recommend it. And of course, all of that is predicated on the severity of the injury, which only you can determine. They can be in a 9 out of 10 out of pain, and they're not that injured. And by the way, that's a misnomer, 9 out of 10. Never ask a patient, what's the level of pain without giving them definitive? I know that from the emergency room. People come in and mark down an 8 plus, And I would look at them, i go, okay, a 10 is if I hacked your leg off with a hacksaw. An eight, a nine is you're writhing on the floor crying, and a t an eight, you can sit, but you can't speak and almost crying. Where do you think your pain is? And they had marked an eight plus. Oh, about a three or four. Happened all the time. Everybody thinks they're in the worst amount of pain until you explain it to them. But again, just because they're out of pain doesn't mean they're better. If they're in pain, they have a problem. Absolute, but out of pain doesn't mean that. Um, so treatment schedule is very important. People need to know that, you know, follow-ups, you're going to see them. And most importantly, you're going to monitor what they're doing. Are they taking that supplement? Are they drinking plenty of water? 
Are they getting rest? Are they using the moist heat? I'm going to go over that. Uh, but a few things here, marketing 101, because a lot of people here don't do it on a full time. And you know, just because you decide you have a good idea, if you don't market it well, as someone said, that's like having the best business plan in the world, but it always stays in the top dr uh, drawer of your desk. It's still just in the top drawer of your desk. So marketing 101, lectures, just like I'm doing now. Many of you think you cannot speak. You cannot talk in front of people. You don't know enough. You know a hundred times more than the patient knows. Maybe even more than that. Obviously, I gave you some ideas here about what to say and how to say it. Just do it. There are community groups, okay? There we go. But before you start that, and I list chiropractors first because, at least in the States, they're the closest thing to musculoskeletal and non-surgical that you ever will get to. Their patients go to see a chiropractor because they do not want surgery. And that's tantamount to having them believe in what you do in regenerative orthopedics. Go to your local chiropractic groups. Knock on the door of a chiropractor. Tell them what you do. Tell them if you get 10 people together, you'll lecture. 10 begets 20 begets 30. I lecture on a continual basis. Obviously, I am still a licensed and boarded chiropractor. Every lecture I give, just a few weeks ago, I gave it to 35 at a lunchtime. Uh, actually, they went to one of these all-day seminars. Do you have to do all-day recredentialing re or continuing education? So, you have to, so they do an all I know someone who runs it. I went to him. I said, what's your admission fee? He goes, $200 for the day. I said, I'll tell you what. You give me 10 to 15 minutes at lunch, I'll give you $100, half of what you charge all day for 15. He goes, hey, that's a no-brainer. I get up there in that 15 minutes, I make that money back, in, as they say, in spades. Every referral I get off of there, and I mean every, whether it's in one day or in one year, believe it or not, is the chiropractor themselves, not their patients. If you've ever been to a chiropractor, it's a very physical, demanding job. Their necks, their backs, their shoulders. And what worst thing for a chiropractor to tell their patient is that I'm having shoulder surgery or let alone back surgery. Every single one is always the chiropractor. I give them a nice discount, they love it, and then they start referring and referring and referring. Because not only are they telling them about me, they're telling them about me who fixed them. So go for it. Physiotherapist, they even wrote it like you guys do. Massage therapist, osteopaths, and yes, even some of those stubborn MDs. There might even be a plastics guy out there who believes in it. But just remember, they have meetings, they have luncheons, they have what, even if you go to their office, get out there, it will pay you back. You may not see it for a while, and then all of a sudden, I'm in Santa Monica, California, beautiful Santa Monica. I live one mile from the ocean. My office is one mile from my house. I'm a one mile guy. The pool I swim in 50 meters outdoors is one mile, but I go wherever. San Jose, California is what we call up north, just south of San Francisco. It's about a four hour drive from my place without traffic, which is never. <laughs> but there is Southwest, which is a cheap $59 flight. Presently, I have about eight patients from there. One day in my office, in the morning, all three patients came from there. None of them knew each other, but they were all going back on the same flight, so we hooked up and I paid for an Uber that took them back to the airport. Go Uber. But anyway, the point is, they will come. And they come every three or six weeks. Distance is not a problem. And how did I get them? Because I lectured at a lecture where their chiropractor was there, and their chiropractor came to see me first for his shoulder, then I did stem cell on his knees, and he praises glory. He says, there are other doctors around me who might might do it, but this guy knows what he's doing. By the way, that's all I do. So remember, I don't go to a dentist who treats teeth 10% of the time, and you don't refer to someone who does something 10% of the time. Make sure they know it and trained in it and learned it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's really important. You tell them that the benefits, I went over it here, I can go over it more and more, of non-surgical therapy. You know it, you think they know it, but unless you repeat it, they don't know it. It's just like when we tell someone don't use heat, uh, ice. 
only use moist heat. We call them. One of the first things they're not doing is applying moist heat. You repeat it, you repeat it, you repeat it. Come up with how you're saying it, what you're saying, and just keep telling them and telling them and telling them. Okay? Tell them about the problems with surgery. Some people know it because grandma, uncle, their friend had it. Other people have no idea. Okay? I don't know if it gets in the press when people have things wrong, but surgery can go bad. And when it does, that's it. You need to repeat it to them. Write a little article, pass it out to papers. You never know. Local are better than national because really the people read their little local papers. Obviously, nowadays, you can write a blog. I wouldn't even know how to spell blog. That's what I have a web guy for. I write it. He takes care of all that other stuff. Okay? Yeah, there's a T word, but unfortunately, our president has made it to be a nasty word. But you could tweet. But again, my web guys take care of all that. Unless you do it at 3 in the morning and you're blocking people from entering the United States, it's a good thing. If you don't catch that humor, start reading the local newspaper. Uh, the web, the web, the web, the web. Hopefully my new website is up. Always improve your website. Always add articles. I don't understand as much as other people, but more than some. They have these little things called bots. Short for robot. And no, Gary, we don't need a traffic light. These bots go all over the internet billions of times a second. They look at your site. They see if it's old. And if it's old, it goes to the back. of the, They see if you have new things, new articles. And as it does, it pushes you forward or pushes you backwards. So make sure you update it. Write an article. Write a news. If there's an article in the London Times, cut and put the link or whatever. It's something new. Have someone do it for you. I don't do it that much, but current, new, things are changing. People want to know. Articles. You saw my videos. I don't know if you liked them or not. My patients, I can't tell you how many videos. If you come tomorrow, I didn't play it today because I don't want to be redundant. I was very fortunate to be on national TV in, in, in the United States. Now, that's a big thing because we have close to 400 million people. I was on a TV show called The Doctor's TV Show. It's a very popular, quote, daytime show, a little bit commercial, but it doesn't matter. I got on there as the regenerative medicine expert and I actually demonstrated a patient. There's a lot of funny stories because TV is done with smoke and mirrors, believe me. And that was about seven years ago. I still get people coming in saying, I saw you on the show. It was either a repeat or their mother videoed it and they watched the video, or they just saw it on my website. But it repeats, it repeats, it repeats. When I went on that show, and then it appeared about six weeks later, for the first three to four weeks, I had to actually hire three extra people. To, our phones rang 24-7. Alabama, Kentucky, Louisiana, Seattle, London, France, Frankfurt, maybe even down under, but it didn't matter. It's promo, it's promo, it's promo. Here's one for you. Make a video of yourself, a little camera on top. I did one for this event. I don't know, a couple of them, if people saw them. Just sit there and say something. It's more than they know. Hi, how are you? I do regenerative medicine, don't have surgery. Call me now. I need the money. Whatever. Say it. <laughs> it helps. Just say it. Hold a lecture at your office. Free lecture, free donuts, free water bottle, whatever. People need to get out. I don't care if you're in practice, it's little problems and stuff like that. Um, okay, so you cannot overpromote yourself, especially in this field. People need to know about it. There will be forms you're going to need. I didn't bring the forms, but I can talk about the forms, okay? So uh, remember, they're, um, PRP and Prolo are about the same, so the forms are the same. So uh, a handout. This is just a handout that you can write. I have some things. What it is, just a synced thing. Everything I'm about to tell you is on my website. My patients know that. But when they call, they still ask. They, everybody will ask the questions on the, just because they read it once doesn't mean they understand it. So when they call, they ask about it. I have a 100%, soon to be 200%, dedicated patient care coordinator. When people call and ask about anything, it goes directly to her. 
If I have a bad tooth, I call a dentist. You give me a number, I call the dentist, I say, my tooth, it's killing me. Can you be here tomorrow morning at 10.30? Yes, fine, where's your address? See you then, goodbye, click, right? Not, in your, not if you start doing regenerative orthopedics. The basic two formats, what they call are, 50% of us know what we have, 50% don't. And 100% have no idea what you do. Really, they don't. Everybody knows what a dermatologist does. Everyone knows what an internist does. Everyone knows what a radiologist does. Regenerative orthopedics, you're speaking Latin, Greek, Spanish, French, whatever you want to say. Someone has to explain it to them. Now, in my practice, I smile a lot because I take no insurance, 100% cash, cash, credit card, check, even South African rand if someone has a few in their pocket. But that's different because remember here you have insurance and if you're doing cash, the most, hello, I would like to know if you take my insurance. Now, if you say no, 90% of what you'll hear is click them hanging up. Really what they're asking is, is there any value in this? Is there any perceived value? So my patient care coordinator, hi, Mrs. Jones, how are you doing? Tell me what's going on. Patients love to talk what's going on. That thing about the insurance went way, way back over here. They start talking about it. She starts talking to them, and then this and that. And only towards the end is she saying, addressing that insurance thing when they bring it up again. But by that time, they've seen that they got some value out of it. They don't know. They're saying, well, you don't take insurance. I'll go to a guy who takes insurance. Okay, he's a surgeon. Oh, I didn't think about that. You know what I mean? So you have to have either yourself or someone talking to them, talking to them, assuaging their fears, making sure they know what's going on, explaining to them what's done. Okay, that's a big thing. And so with these handouts, you need to have something, what to expect once they're done. The pain, the this, the no anti-inflammatories, the moist heat, when to call us, when not to call us. Uh, we do a lot of injections. We put what is called paper tape. And we know it's just thin little, take that off with, you know, in 24 hours. Someone once left it on. Um, for like a week, they almost ended up seeing, uh, <laughs> it was like glue stuck to their skin. So whatever, it just tells them a lot what to do and what not to do. The regimen, we have a regimen, I'm gonna go over it, it's a vitamin regimen and a few other things, make sure they follow it. I don't care how many times you tell people, if you don't tell them and give them something, it doesn't mean anything. For stem cell, which is really important, we demand there is someone in the room when we talk to them. I don't care if they come from Kentucky or the guy from Germany. Someone in there listening, because they will not hear. He never said that. Oh, and by the way, which I didn't list up here, when everybody is done, just does everyone know what <laughs> CYA means? Cover your rear, but we use a different word for rear in the United States. CYA, cover it. They sign something. I have been explained everything, what to do and what, and I have been able to ask every question. And they sign it. Because later they say, you never told me that. I say, look at this. It helps. Because when they sign that, they go back and read the other form. Okay? Consent. Everybody needs a consent form. You're sticking needles in people. Okay? You're not putting a band. This is... I uh, forget about your regular this and if you want I have copies and we can talk about it I, I give it to people in my program when they come and train this is very specific it says every, they've had alternatives they know what surgery is they've time to ask questions they know that it may not work that it may cause this 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 lots of things and the last word is D E A T H and no matter how, what language you speak it in it means death have we ever caused it? No, but you put it down there, okay? They need to see it, okay? You need to have a specific for this. You've been explained, it is experimental, et cetera, et cetera. Just, I don't know the laws and rules down here, but you can never cover yourself too much, you know? The worst thing you want is an ugly, nasty patient getting on the web or going to 
medical boards, et cetera, et cetera. Look, you can be 100% correct, but they're going to do 100% damage in the discussion. Stem cell, as I said, that's a big thing in stem cell. Aftercare. We send them the aftercare prior because they read, oh, I'm going to have to do that? Oh, I can't do that. I can't have the procedure. We read that to them three or four times before. Incision aftercare, they have tiny little incisions. Remember, we're just making, you know, quarter inch little things, but we put, you know, special bandages. We use uh, steri strips. You use, you use that term, steri strips. You know, when to take them all, everything. They need to know, 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 and have contact. As soon as we give them the contact of the nurse, they never call them. If we don't give them the contact, they call them. It's all about security. Stem cell regimen, again, what to take, what not to take, how to take it. Consent, a different one. Now, when they come from stem cell, they sign a stem cell and a PRP, because I am using PRP. It's almost the same. It's not redundant. It's, you, you can never have too many forms signed. Okay? Before your, so that before your procedure, the moment they book a stem cell, okay, they need, they get a confirmed date. That goes out immediately by email, and then we read it to them. We go over to them two or three times. Never expect your patients to read anything, okay? It's like those forms on the internet when you get an application. It's like 14 pages. Do you agree? No one reads that. Okay, and on the day procedure, again, goes out several weeks, if not months before, for stem cell. The other ones, they're coming in more often, so it doesn't matter. But it's important to have these because patients will ask, and they'll ask again and again, and you want to give them copies, and you want to make sure they talk to you about it. Um, let's see what we got here. All right, slides, let's see. Stuck on. Let's see if we can do it there. Any help from the back there? This is 20 of 28. Oh, that's the thing. Oh, there's just some videos. Okay, I'm just gonna ask. So the uh, form here. Let's see if this should be one. Okay. Um, I can talk a little bit, a few things. So, there we go. Let's go ahead and click it. Just listen. My name is Susie, and I suffered from severe wrist pain for probably over a year. It was hindering my work. In fact, I couldn't even lift my purse without seeing stars. That's how painful it was. I saw two different orthopedic surgeons uh, who gave me cortisone injections. Uh, it did not work. Their uh, next option would be surgery. I did not want to do that. So I started uh, hearing about prolotherapy, and I researched it online and found Dr. Peter Fields, and I saw his testimonials, like I'm doing today, and I was just convinced that this is the place I should be. So I've been um, seeing Dr. Fields for a couple of months, and I have to tell you that after my very first treatment, I felt 70%. And now I have finished my sixth treatment and I'm absolutely pain free. So I highly recommend it if you're at all thinking about it to try this. It's like a miracle. All right, so a few things to take home from there. She started off, I was in pain for over a year. Intelligent woman, businesswoman. She had no idea what regenerative orthopedics was. I lectured somewhere. That someone told someone, someone told someone. So that's a payoff right there on your lecturing. Think about it. Then two cortisone injections. Wrist surgery, God, the failure right there, carpal tunnel surgery, forget it. And so, um, A, getting the word out, and B, you know, she started, it was great. After the first one, she started feeling better. That's good, but you don't stop coming in. They got to keep coming in. 
This is, you know, they're going to feel better. We always say when they're getting better, it's like a jagged staircase up. So they go up, they come down. Maybe three up, two down. Three and a half up, two and a half, one and a half down. Boom. So it's going to be a staggering thing. So, and a lot of patients come in and go, you know what? It's my fourth treatment. I kind of, I'm almost halfway back to where my third treatment was. I said, yeah, but how long were you feeling good for? Oh, in these three weeks, about two weeks. I said, great. On your last one, you only felt belt for a week and a half. So you are improving. And another one is, you know what, doc? I'm the same as I was when I started. We know exactly what to have. We say, what were you taking before it started? Oh, I was taking a Motrin probably two, twice a day, and then twice a week I took uh, hydrocodone. How many are you taking now? I said, so you're better. You were taking pain suppressant medication. Now you're not taking it, and you're in the same, meaning you should be way, way hurting if you're not taking it. You are, oh, yeah, you're right. So you got to remind them. Um, let me just see if this advances on, because there is one or two more slides. Here we go. So pre and post information treatment. This is very important. Um, remember, they can't take any anti-inflammatory. That's a big thing. People take them like cotton candy. In the United States, the three most prevalent medications over the counter taken are non-steroidal anti-inflammatories or anti-inflammatories, um, stuff for stomach upsets and stuff for headaches. You go into any pharmacy, there are hundreds of those things. They market them like crazy. People think it's the pop wall. In the U.S. military, unfortunately, it is. A guy can come in with a hernia or a ruptured spleen. They're going to tell him, take Motrin. We'll see you in two weeks. So the military guys know that. Heat, not ice. Important. Heat, 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 and more heat. It's got to be moist heat. None of this dry heat. Okay? Light duties for a few days. You know, if they're construction workers, they can go to the site. They can't climb down in the pit. If they want to stay home, it's better. They want to sit on the couch all day? No. They got to move. They got to get up. But if you're doing their knee or their hip, we tell them, when you sit, go home, do a few things, then sit for two hours. Have the clicker, have your water, have the cell phone, have the charger. It's not up and down and up and down and up and down. It's sitting. You got to give yourself those breaks. Okay? Return slowly to exercise. A little swimming, a little stationary bike, a little more, a little more. Can't go running a marathon the next week. Follow the treatment plan. We make the treatment. Your treatment plan is as important as the treatment itself. You fall off of it, you're going to hinder it. Oh, I'm busy. I have this. I have that. Listen, it's your body. You know, we have a saying, where are you going to move when it wears out? Ain't going to happen. Take care of it. Patients will tell you they can't. It costs too much too much time, this and that. I just say to them, what happens if you wake up tomorrow morning, you can't get out of bed? Who's paying the bills? Who's driving the kids to school? Think about it. Don't get to that point. I don't want to threaten them, but you tell them the truth. It can happen. That hip bothers so much, you can't even get up. Listen to this guy tell you about his shoulder, then I'll tell you a few more things. My name is Jim Apollinaria. I am 70 years old. I'm a very active person. I work out uh, five days a week at the gym, lifting weights. Uh, and I've been lifting weights for the last uh, 20 years. As a result of that, uh, I had developed uh, pain on both shoulders. I had uh, an arthroscopic surgery on my left uh, shoulder, uh, but that didn't help. And my right shoulder was uh, uh, very much in pain. I was referred to Dr. Fields for a prolotherapy uh, treatment. I have been uh, taking this treatment for the last uh, uh, four or uh, five months. And as a result of that, uh, it, helped, it has helped me tremendously. I am now uh, uh, pain free. I have 90% uh, uh, mobility on both shoulders. And I continue to uh, work out uh, five days a week. And I think. Uh, Dr. Fields for all the treatment that he has uh, given me. All right, so there's a guy again. He had shoulder surgery. It didn't help. So remember, we get out. We talk to these people. I think there's another shoulder one, but I'll probably skip it uh, because I want to talk to you about a few other. Well, 
Why not? One last one here and just see which. Eh, actually, we'll skip that one. Supplements. I do offer supplements. Everybody has different packages and things like that, but I try to get to the basics, at least for this. Um, I have amino acids. I feel that amino acids are very important because amino acids are the building blocks of everything, let alone ligaments and tendons. So we're trying to rebuild. We want more building material. A good supplement, amino acid, and by the way, we do have a handout telling patients about the different kinds. Um, in the U.S., we have, you know what Walmart is or these big stores. You have so stores that sell them. They're worthless. You have middle-level stores like a health food store. And there are companies that only sell to physicians. Now, using U.S. statistics, I can tell you that if we have 300 million people in the United States and half of them take supplements, that's 150 million people the companies are marketing to, 150 million to market to. If you have 100,000 physicians and 50,000 use supplements, you only have 50,000 to market to. So the marketing budget is much less going to the physicians, much, much higher quality. There is a quality in supplements as there are quality in everything else. So amino acids are very important to people. Okay, we do use something. There's a company that makes a ligament product called Standard Process. They're one of the oldest vitamin companies in the United States, very well respected. And it's called Ligaplex. Obviously, you'll find something down here. But something specifically to target those ligaments, to grow them. Then you'll see we put vitamin C because a lot of people take it, but they take garbage. Vitamin C gives you a better immune system. If your immune system is better, you're going to heal better. End of discussion. Of course, with all this, we tell people drink water and sleep. It's important. You know, if they sleep three hours a night, it's not going to be easy. They have to, you know, hydrate themselves. A lot of people do not hydrate themselves well. We give them glutamine because glutamine is the precursor for growth form hormone production. We produce growth in your body every night, three hours after you go to bed. So if you put more fuel out there, fuel being glutamine, the body hopefully will build a bigger fire. People get it. Lastly, I do have a product there. There was a pharmacist I met before. Is she still in here? There she is. Thank you very much. Um, and she's a compounding pharmacist, so if you need a good one, she's right in the back. Secretagog. We get something from a big store called University Compounding Pharmacy, one of the largest in the United States in San Diego, California, and they make a secretagog. It gets something to secrete, and what it gets to secrete is the pituitary gland. You don't have to do too much about biochemistry and remember way back, but we produce it in the hypothalamus growth and it is stored in the pituitary gland. As we get older, we release more and hold on to more. Kids in their teenage years release all of it. If you've ever tried to wake a 14-year-old up at 7 in the morning to be on time to something, you know what I'm talking about. A bomb could go off and they'd roll over and go back to sleep. They produce so much growth hormone. So the side effect of growth hormone production is better sleep. You tell your patients that, they're going to take it just for that effect. It helps your body secrete more. It is a prescription item in the United States, but under the laws, physicians are allowed to sell prescription items, so we carry it. It's not cheap, but it works tremendously. And again, if they're producing more growth and releasing more growth, they're going to grow more. And what is regenerative medicine except growth medicine? Um, there are other things along the way. Let me just see what I got coming up here. Just one or two more people, and then I'm going to tell you a few other things. Hi, my name is May Huey. I'm 43, and I'm a former patient of Dr. Fields. I came in because I had a very, very, very painful knee situation. I ran a half marathon barely walk to my car, I must have done something to hurt it. So on my Facebook postings, I had this huge cry for help, complaining about my knee, and a former patient of Dr. Fields suggested I go check him out. So I came in for a thorough consultation, and right away I got treated. Um, I had four sessions with the prolotherapy um, treatments and two PRPs. And ever since then, that was back in February, and at the end of 
June, I was already running again. So that was about a year and a half ago. And since then, I've done eight full marathons, numerous half marathons. And just recently, about a month ago, I just completed another full marathon. So Dr. Peter Fields is awesome. His team is great. I highly recommend it to anyone that's considering treatment for their injuries, any kind of situation that they have. Um, I can't thank you guys enough. I really appreciate it. And I'm running again. Yay! So thank you so much. Bye. You know, so the bottom line, she actually mentioned something there, Facebook. I don't do Facebook, but my staff does. People talk. Get the word out. Let them know. There are going to be people in pain. They don't know they're supposed to be better. They don't understand. This is a shoulder. And I had a knee, which we already did. Uh, let me just see something here. Wow. Okay, we'll do one more. Let me just have you listen to this guy and then I'm going to answer all your Hello. questions. My name is Dan Correa, 64 years old. I was working out at the gym near the bench press, felt a pain in my shoulder, had an MRI, it was a tear in the tendon, a labrum tear, and they were suggesting surgery. I found Dr. Fields on the internet, I heard about PRP, wanted to find out more about it. A friend of mine elected to do have surgery, it was out six months doing his therapy before he could play golf again. I love playing golf and other sports. So I decided to come and see Dr. Fields. He told me I was a perfect candidate, so he treated me three treatments now. My pain is gone, I'm able to play golf again, I'm starting to do the bench press and work out with weights again. I feel much better, thanks to Dr. Fields. So there you see it, I mean in a nutshell, and I'm going to answer all your questions here. We have a good 20 minutes. He tore his labrum. The surgery was the only thing they told him. And he immediately went, six months? Come on, you got to be kidding me. Remember, they started, they treat him, he started, he only needed three, depending on the severity. So the whole word is, the whole thing is get the word out, get the word out, let people know. Um, someone asked me about secretropin. It's actually called secretropin. It was developed by a physician in the United States. I can give you all the information and the detail. I don't know if you can buy it and import it, but they may have something. It's a spray, goes under their tongue at night. Patients love it. I use it myself. Um, as I said, um, if, how many people will be there tomorrow? How many people will not be here tomorrow? That's it, several, all right. So. Um, you know, you'll see more detail there. One of the things before I get to the questions, you know, I use a product, all the machines I use to concentrate, and there are different machines out there. Some people don't concentrate. If you concentrate, you get, I hate to say it, more concentration, more density. You have about a million cubic centimeters of platelets floating in your blood, I get seven to 10. I use a company called Harvest. The big company is Terumo, but they're called Harvest. I, spin the, I use them for their PRP, I use them for their stem cell and their fat. They also have the devices for the extraction of the fat. It's not a tremendously difficult procedure, but you have to be very accurate and quick and, because you are going in, you do anesthetize the person. I only use local, more local and more local. Yes, we give them a hydrocodone for the pain, and the most important one is a Xanax for anxiety. Actually, every patient should take Xanax before they come see a doctor. It would make our lives easier. But that's <laughs> that or a shot of tequila. But no. but no. Um, and then you know we have them relax for a while. And so um, the let me just get this off of here. Um, the harvest concentrator. The company gives tremendous support. Even here in Australia, I know they have representatives and stuff. Um, I feel that getting seven to ten times the concentration is just giving them a better chance. Yes, with PRP you may do it a few times, with stem cell you have one shot, so to speak. So the better chance you give them, uh, they have bona fide studies showing they give seven to ten, some other companies, someone mentioned a company, uh, you know, they may give five to seven, you can even spin whole blood, but honestly, I've found over the years of doing this, and I have done 
over 10,000 procedures. So this is all I do. I've done now close to 200 stem cell procedures. The average doc in the United States who even does stem cell has done maybe 15 or 20. So there does some, come something from you know, doing it for a while. That's all I do, exclusively what I do. Obviously, people seek me out. I'm not telling you that's all you should do. But you know, if you become an expert in that field, I'll be right there. It will help. And at least they know you as that. And um, I can talk to you more about the companies and stuff, um, the supplements, as I said. But the biggest ones, the processors, they send representatives there. They answer questions. If the kits fail, they help you with it and stuff. Yes, it may cost a little more. Obviously, the cost is passed on to the client, not only in money, but in value they get from getting the best of the product. I mean, we all don't have to, you know, you want something that's sturdy and safe and strong and reliable. So using that really makes a big difference. I will say that um, I do have courses. Doctors do come from around the world. They spend, some spend two, we don't have them spend one day because you're not, they may spend two or three days, they may spend a week. Fortunately, I live on the outskirts of the second largest city in the United States, Los Angeles, California. So, you know, people come, they see me for a couple of days, they take their kids to Disneyland, to Universal Studios, to the beaches, et cetera, and then come back for a couple more days. So it doesn't have to be contiguous. And we can talk more about that. Um, obviously, I have patients come. If a patient comes in and their stem cell, we interview them on the phone. We look at their MRIs and x-rays after we interview them. Then all they do, like the fellow from Germany, he showed up on Monday, he flew in. Tuesday, I did the exam on him. It concurred with everything we had talked about. Wednesday, I did the procedure for his own satisfaction. He stayed around Thursday. Friday, he happened to go to Florida just to relax. So my patients do come from around the world for the stem cell because it's only a one-time thing. But it's worth it because it saves their lives. It not only saves their lives in giving them the ability to do what they want to do, it saves them from a very potentially disastrous result that could happen from having a total joint replacement. It's not the end of the world, and if it works out, it's great. But if it doesn't work out, pardon the expression, it is a death sentence. You live with it. So my feeling is if you can try something that if it doesn't work out, you can go forward, that's always the way to go. Choosing the end result first could affect them. I'm going to ask some questions here. Go ahead, young man. Well, all right. So PR, here's the thing. Extracting PRP is a blood draw. Now, I happen to be an ER doc, and as my staff knows, I can get blood from a stone. But, yeah, so I have, my nurses do that. I never even see them. So remember, they may be there for an hour and a half. I may see them for 10 minutes. Now, I did tell you how to PA. When she treats, let's say, a knee, it probably takes about 10 or 12 minutes to treat 15 to treat that knee. We're talking on the table, ready to go, start injecting. I take maybe two to three because I've been doing it that much longer. But drawing the blood, spinning it down, it's not your normal uh, centrifuge. You, know, you have to have a special centrifuge, which you can deal with them on and stuff. And also the quality, how you extract it. You do it too fast, you'll break platelets. And remember, we're drawing anywhere from 35 to 60 mLs of blood. This is not a two or three mL blood. You got to have a good stick. You can't have that vein collapsing after 20 mL because you need a lot of blood. Okay, um, and you have. To, but injecting it—that's the core. That's what you need to know. You need to know how to inject, where to inject, why to inject, and like every good dentist will tell you, you have to know what to do when something goes wrong. All right. Not many times will it go wrong, but if it does, you got to act. You got to know. When, if, did I inject, should I have not, in, you know. Uh, I have a friend, very good friends at dentist. He once told me, you give me, I said, I bet you you could train a monkey in a couple of days to drill a teeth. He said, give me a well-trained monkey, I'll do it in six hours. But he won't know what to do if something goes wrong or if he doesn't do it right. So it's time, it's care, carefulness and stuff. So the extraction process, not too much. Bone marrow is a different thing. You have to see 
If you've never seen one, I would never, ever, ever do seen one. You have to see several and practice. You know, there are cadaver labs. We may be sending up a cadaver lab in Southern California to train people and stuff. Because, you know, you're puncturing, you're going down, you're going into bone marrow. And it's only a certain level, how to pull it out, what to, you know, make sure, you know. If I get a good tap, I can have that marrow out and I pull out 40 cc's of marrow. I can pull it out. I've, ha I've done it in seven minutes. Sometimes it's been 25. I hate to say it. It's kind of like tapping for oil. You, you know, everyone's seen. Sometimes they stick it in and that thing gushes. In other words, six months later, they go, we're bankrupt. <laughs> Let's get out of here. It's a dry tap. You can get a dry tap. You have to know where you're going back in when to go back in. But remember, if they're coming from Perth to, to Melbourne to have it done, they're not coming. You can't say come back to, in three weeks. In two, maybe that. Uh, the, the best place, there are some people who go in the shin that's been shown you can get splinters of bone and the blood is, the horse is not that good. The best place is the posterior hip. I go about, I have to think in centimeters, which I can, about five centimeters, uh, let's say to the exterior of the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint, and also five centimeters down for us two by two. So five by five and in that area, but you have to find a flattened area and you have to know the angle. Because if it's like this, then the trocar goes in like that. You gotta be perpendicular at all times. If not, you could slide along and actually just be going under the surface. You'll know the difference. It looks like blood, but it's not. It's kind of like a thick blood when it comes out. But you, the first time you do it and you get a proper one, you'll, I mean, it's like hitting the oil well. As you're pulling out the trocar, that thing is gurgling up already. Other times, you have to wiggle, you have to, I'm getting into technique, and so I don't want to get in too much. Same thing with extracting fat. Fat I get from the abdomen, I find it the best place in the world, okay? Everybody, everybody has some fat. And once in a while, it's tough. And again, you know when you go in, what's gonna happen when you go out. Uh, but then there's dense, there's procedures we do to compact it before we spin it. One looks like a decanter, like wine, you know, like, curds and whey, you gotta let it sit and layer out. Some fat is a good extraction, some isn't. I must admit, I use Harvest, so they, and I am very proud, I am the largest individual office Harvest user in the United States, so uh, they send a tech every time. Every procedure I do, the tech is there. Sometimes we talk about, all right, he's a Man U fan, I'm a Chelsea fan, what can you say? We won, they lost if you follow football. But we talk that, and other times, sorry, sometimes we talk soccer, but other times he's in there helping me, he's helping me. I gotta take a few other questions, then I'll come back to you. Everything goes through the harvest machine. What? Well, it does all the concentrating for me. I do the work. No, no, then you're put, you have to determine how much you're putting back in, the quantities you're putting in back in, which to, where you're putting it. If, you know, in a knee, a knee can bear, in stem cell, a small person, 10 cc's total volume. You can get upwards of 15. Anything more than that, you're gonna blow, the capsule's gonna be so tight, they're gonna be limping for a week and a half, and you're not gonna get that much better benefit. You know, a big, big guy, I can put in 13 cc's, now, if I'm doing bilateral, I may cut it down, because remember, you're doing unilateral, they can limp. You're doing bilateral, it's tough. Usually somewhere between 10 and 12, and you have to approximate how much fat, how much PRP, how much bone marrow you're putting in there. And you have to add in, you gotta put a little lidocaine. Bone marrow and, 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 uh, bone marrow and uh, fat are not too caustic. PRP, the platelets are caustic. If you inject straight PRP into someone, you're gonna cause a burn and a flare. Some people can handle it, some can't. Usually you, have, you always should put some lidocaine. Now I use a high powered infrared light that one of the benefits, it actually deactivates some of those C3, which are pain moduling uh, chemicals in your body. So it lessens it. But there is still some sort of flare. So you have to add in, there's a whole formula and you gotta think about how much of this and how much of that, et cetera. By the way, you can only use lidocaine. You can't use marcaine. Marcaine deactivates platelets. 
You got to know these things. When you do the procedure and you're cutting into someone, as every good plastic surgeon will tell you, you have to use epinephrine. But you can't use epinephrine inside the joint because that's going to decrease blood flow, and you need blood flow. So you got to make sure your vials are marked and labeled and that the nurse doesn't, he knows that, give you the wrong one. Because if you put epi in there or if you happen to cut and you, the fat, really you're irritated. You hadn't put epi under the sleeve of the surfaces again. That person's going to be black and blue for weeks, if not longer. And the trouble with black and blue under the abdomen, again, plastics will tell you it can coagulate. And then there's got like this hard lump there for, it doesn't, it'll go away. And three weeks later, they're calling you every day, right? You know it will go away. But in three weeks, they're like, what's what do I got, a girdle on here? It can happen. Things can happen. So learning it is very, as I said, uh, I teach a very, I go over all this in my course and stuff. But I'm going to take a few. Any other questions out there that we have? Yes. Can you just expand on that five minus static toxicity and stem? Okay, so lycocaine toxicity, again, uh, it's about 110 cc's when you get it. We're never even getting close to that. But I do keep track of it. Everything is recorded. Everything that goes in, everything that gets wasted. In the, when I do it, it is intra-office, but we make one room completely sterile. Now, we're not doing 100% sterility. I mean, I am masked. I have sterile gloves on and stuff, but, and the table is cleaned, but it's not as sterile like an OR environment. But everything, we have one person just to record what goes in, what goes out, what gets, there's a mixture of stuff. Lidocaine toxicity, if you were using lots, actually in stem cell we don't. In PRP and Prolo, you can use more and more and stuff because we mix it with the PRP. You know, the most I've ever given anyone is about 30, 35. Again, you're going to max out at about 110. So we're not even coming close. But, 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 and he's a surgeon and he knows that. If something goes wrong and they're in pain, you got to start giving it to them. And then you, if I shoot them with 10 or 20, i got to mark it down and know I'm not giving them. But no, we're not lidocaine. Sorry. But marcaine can never be used. We only use 1% lidocaine. It does come in, or lidocaine, as you say. But we don't use 2% because 2% has a many-hour um, anesthetic effect. If you're treating an elbow, a knee, or hip, and you use 2%, and you happen to come close to a nerve, which can happen, you will deaden that nerve. Lidocaine 1% will come back in 30 to 60 minutes. And if you happen to deaden the nerve in the leg, they think they're paralyzed. I don't care how many degrees you have hanging on the wall. They're like, holy cow, I can't move my leg. But you sit them in the waiting room and 60 minutes later, they're fine. But if it's four hours later, let me tell you something, you're doing this. <laughs> so we don't use 2%, even though it would have a stronger effect. There are a couple for fat, we can occasionally use it. But if you're going around the joint, remember, if you do it enough, you will hit a nerve periodically. You have to know, you've got to be quick on the trigger. Remember, this is, I don't want to say, it's not simple, simple, but there are certain things that can happen. And uh, you have to know what to do, when to do. Did that answer? Yes. Okay, m ultra, <laughs> here's a good topic of mine. There have been actually studies on ultrasound guidance. Number one is ultrasound guidance of all the uh, radiographic things, MRI, CAT scan, and ultrasound, is the most, by far and away, operator dependent. So when they teach ultrasound school, musculoskeletal is not high on their list. It's for babies, number one, and some other soft... So you have to have a highly technical. Some doctors say they've learned it, but believe me, they're not like a tech. So that's number one. Number two is most of the time you're going into a joint. They use ultrasound for knees, shoulders, and you're going what is called IA intraarticular. It is not hard to go intraarticular. It's very simple. So if you need an ultrasound to go intraarticular, you're kind of, it's like a crutch. The only thing that ultrasound has been shown to benefit is the wallet of the doctor whose offices use it, okay? Meaning, what are the three most important things you need to know as a regenerative medicine specialist? Anatomy, anatomy, and a more anatomy. If you only get two out of those three, you need a backup like ultrasound. I've done over 10,000. I've never needed one. I know exactly where I'm going. 
I'm visualizing what's on the inside, where the ligaments, where the tendons are. So if you trust yourself and you trust your hands and your knowledge, you don't really need it. And again, it's the time and the thing. Are there any other questions? Because obviously we're coming to the end here. How much fat do you need? How much what? How much fat do you need to attract to the fat? Uh, the fat, we're getting 40, we get 220 cc's but this is all harvest thing, and then it has to be compacted down. You get about 40, but remember, when you extract fat, you get fat mixed with some fluid, a little bit of blood, and then you get the oils, because that's, you don't need, it has to be extracted out. Again, tomorrow I go into a little more detail, not detail, but I show some really good MRIs and CAT scans and x-rays. I will have cards up here. I do run a course. It's only a slight little 15-hour flight, but then again, I'm one mile from the ocean, You'll learn a lot if you come there, or if your patients come there, they'll be happy. Last question. Yeah, arteriovascular, the, what, a, yeah, all right. So procaine, no, lidocaine, lidocaine, lidocaine. And number two is yes, AVNs, what they want to do is scoop it out surgically. We put the stem cells in there. I had a guy with a hip thing, put it in there, regrow it. It was like he never had it before. So avascular necrosis, uh, Big time. I want to thank you all very much. I'll be down here answering questions. Actually, outside, Dr. Lewis, make sure you treat him well. He's got a great first name. Take care. Bye.